There he is. Yo. There he is. Big hey, man. Guys. What's up? How's it? How's it, brother? How's it, Craig? Good to meet you, man. Yes, yes, man. I'm super stoked to be meeting you. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Hey, you still in your work gear there, my boy? I uh, know. I just put a smart shirt on for you guys. Oh, what a legend, That's, buddy. That is yeah. And yeah. chest. You say I was n- I was naked and I don't have any pants on. Oh, <laughs> perfect, but, but I was we naked kinda... too all day, actually. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. You guys should have had a nice Skype together, all right? <laughs> yeah. I have sent some compromising photos, which I was assured would not be brought up on the show. <laughs> we, need, we need photos for the show notes. That's it's, called a broma- it's called a bromance. <laughs> yeah, well, Craig, we're actually we're hoping you, you're going to sort of take your top off as well, bad for us. <laughs> show us those Me? guns. Yeah, yes, we thought it's cold it's here, guys. Three of us. It's like 25 you're the, degrees. In the you're, the one who's, you're the one who's been running. You, you've been running. We haven't been running. Yes, yeah, yes. It's looking like a machine, bud. I can hardly walk. My legs are so sore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I but please, know, man, man. You, you've always had flipping mean <laughs> calves. Like, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen them. They, they, were, they were gone for a little while, but they came back. They came yeah. back with a vengeance. <laughs> so, right. Okay. For my dad's mom, because she, she was born in Cardiff. So oh. he was really happy. I've got two Welsh names. My first and second, second name is Vaughan. And my first oh. name is, 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 is Dylan, the Welsh spelling. So she was still... Va- Vaughan is a Welsh name. I didn't realize. Yeah, no. V-A-U-G-H-A-N. So it's written Vaughan, oh. but it's, it's pronounced Vaughan. Interesting. Uh, so cool, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's the connection, bud. I'm the Wales. Gareth Ewan. And they're both. Yeah, I, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's there we go. <laughs> both our first and second. And we went to Wales. We we had that discussion in Cardiff. About but did we? Yeah, yeah. Fuck, you got a great memory, bud. <laughs> I, remember, I remember. I remember that. Yeah, this is not amazing, buddy. Don't worry, it's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. It's okay. <laughs> Tell me about it, bud. You yeah. interviewed Bruce Lipton. That's awesome. I haven't listened to it yet. Oh, bud, you're gonna oh, love cool, it. Man. Yeah, because I read, it, his, yeah. I read his book while I was in the hospital. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, the biology of belief. It's a heavy oh. fucking read, but um, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. And I, and I listened to his um, Honeymoon Effect, I think it's called. Is that oh, did book? you? Oh, cool. Yeah, on, on e-books, I listened to it. And, and uh, it's awesome. That stuff really influenced what happened, how I handled stuff in the hospital. No actually. ways. Wow. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. amazing. Um, but, but I didn't know that you had interviewed him and I was gr- scrolling through the other day and I'm like, fucking hell, they've interviewed Bruce Lipton. Oh, that's so I've cool, man. To, I've got to listen to that when I get a chance. He's no. going to hear um, Gareth giving you a poo chat and then, my man, she's going, <laughs> what? This <laughs> is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our favorite, Dill. Like, Craig and I, like, we like, can you have that <laughs> echo? Yeah. yeah. Is that <laughs> echo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a, we had a, we have, we've got a couple of family group chats and one of them is my uncle and my aunt and their kids and then us. And uh, so, because they often are on holiday, my folks and, and my aunt and uncle are often on holiday together. So there was a one stage where everyone was sending selfies and then my one cousin, he sends a selfie. And I'm like, look at the selfie. And I'm like, He's sitting on the fucking toilet. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can just see the, 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 the top of the toilet in the background and then the ceramic ah. glass. And I'm like, listen, this is not WhatsApp protocol. You know, like, you can't, <laughs> no, 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 you no. can't send a selfie from the toilet. Uh, there's rules. Yeah, there's rules. <laughs> yeah, great. Waking up. Cool stuff. Good evening there, Dylan Harold. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Hey, how's it going? Good to be here. Thanks. Oh, but awesome, we're, man. we're just uh, so happy to have you on here, man. Like, this has really been a long time coming. Uh, you're such an avid listener and, and like massive supporter of the podcast. And, uh, you know, you've got such a, an amazing story yourself. You, you're sort of very, you're a very brave man, very courageous and we're really looking forward to sort of tucking into your story uh, tonight. So, cool. you know, I'm looking forward to it. Time. Looking forward to it as well. Yeah, cool, man. So, so just a bit of a brief like background, I guess, mm. for everyone listening is you and I went to high school together and, uh, you know, we enjoyed like a great time together. We played sports. Uh, we went on rugby tours. And, um, you know, then I guess after high school, everyone kind of goes their own way and these sort of things. And, you know, you did your thing. I did my thing. You went overseas to Portugal and then, you know, I came here and then like in the last few years, you kind of properly reconnected and yeah. 
um, soon we'll be neighbors in Portugal. So it's really great to reconnect with you again, my man. Yeah, yeah, I did, and I, and I have fond memories of you at high school. Like Gareth was uh, Craig. Gareth was one of these guys who was good at. He was one of those annoying people that was good at fucking everything. <laughs> uh, was, I think he was in the the buff class, if I remember correctly. You uh, had like full colors for rugby for all the G of, class. So I mean the G. Yeah, would you yes. guys talking about that on the podcast? That was, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you 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 can talk about it, Gareth, because you weren't in one of those low classes. Yeah, but, uh, that's what I thought as well at the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Chana, I was demoted. I started in the G class and then I went to the B, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but uh, uh, but you you're always cool. You're always a good guy, and and, and always just the same. And then we had some good chats, and and so I always have fond memories of you. At even though we were ran in like different circles. But uh, but yeah, you know, you were a good guy anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's so, cool. so nothing's changed. You, nothing's, nothing's changed. Very kind of you. Well, you know the the feelings mutual on that side of things, but so. Um, yeah, just super excited now for the, for this opportunity, man, because it was really interesting. Um, probably about, I don't know, maybe a six months, a year ago. I can't remember what it was now. Like, but we went to Portugal to, um, go look at places and stuff. And we went yeah. and met you and your wife, Diane, and uh, yeah. we had dinner with you. And I had like, like, this is the thing of like, you know, people, their whole lives and you literally don't know their stories. And I just remember like listening to you at dinner going, Cheap is this guy. He's got a crazy story. We have to get him on the podcast, and then uh-huh. and now we're doing it. So that's really cool. And um, yeah, man, looking forward to getting stuck into it. So um, so bad. You grew up in Johannesburg. Uh, you went to Sharon Lee Primary. Um, your folks got divorced when you were about twelve years old, and yeah. you actually had to become man of the house back then. Uh, maybe you can just sort of take us back to kind of the early years of what life was like for you. What were your memories of, yeah. of things? Sure. Um, life was pretty good. I mean, you know, you never want to, you know, uh, divorce is never a nice thing, but, uh, you know, besides a couple of, you know, maybe a hairy year or two, um, it was, I had a good childhood. I had a good upbringing. My, my parents tried their best. Um, they were great parents. Um, Johannesburg was not what it is today. You know, I think I, I, I look at like my girls and, and, and the childhood they have here. And that's more similar to what we had when we were, in South Africa back then, you know, we we used to go play in the bush behind the house, and yeah. and we used to go ride our bikes and play in the river and things like that. And and now, you know, we can't, they can't, you know, no one does that anymore. So we had a good childhood, you know. And we were, um, I just remember everything changed while I was at, while we were at school, you know. So about the age of twelve, things started to change, and there was all the political pressure, and then it was. Um, I think that's 90, 94, 95. So we were in, our, you know, we were teenagers when Mandela started, when Mandela was released and the Rugby World Cup and all of those changes started happening. And yeah. I still remember my parents buying cans of food and things because, you know, there were going to be riots and we were going to get thrown out of our yeah. homes and, and nothing like that ever happened. And, but, you know, generally childhood was good. We, we had a, you know, I had a, a good upbringing. Um, my parents both remarried and married really nice people, you know, so both my stepmom and my stepdad are really good to, to, to me and my sister. And uh, so, yeah, no complaints about, about how we grew up. Um, when my folks got divorced, yeah, then, you know, my dad moved out and, and I had to almost, yeah, I had to, I was, I was a young man, but I had to sort of take, take, become the man of the house and, and, and look after my mom and look after my sister in some ways. And that was quite a big responsibility at that age. But you know, I wouldn't change anything. And 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 my dad is with he, with who he's supposed to be with, and my mom is with who she's supposed to be with. And it just worked out. So so yeah, uh, childhood was good. And and you know, we always had food on the table. We went through a couple of tough times in high, when I was in high school. Um, but you know, we always had food on 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 the table and and clothes on our back and could go away on rugby tours and things like that. So so we did. We were we were. We were fine, you know. We were we were good. Cool man. Um, so good, 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 good upbringing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, buddy. And at the time, Dylan, did you kind of feel that pressure that you were the one that needed to kind of, you know, be that person, be the the, the older kid, and and take yeah. a bit of kick of each other? I, I, I think at that age, you you can't really vocal, you can't really put it into words or mm. verbalize it or, or get a real understanding around it. You know, it, it, it can, the understanding that that was the phase that I was in 
or that's what was going on was after a lot of conversations afterwards and, and people and sharing your story with people and then saying, listen, for a long time you were doing this. And, um, and, but you know, you, I did feel, you know, my mom struggled a bit when, when my dad left and I felt a responsibility. Um, I protected my sister a lot, you know, when, when things yeah. were a bit hairy, some evenings I would tell my sister to go to, go to sleep and, and, and I would, I would like be there with my mom. Um, so yeah, you did feel that pressure. I was very angry for a long time. I was angry with my, with my father for leaving and it took a long time for, for me to understand that it was not just his fault, you know, <laughs> and that, uh, and it was also, you know, my mom who one day said, you know, it wasn't just your father's fault, which wow. that was huge. I mean, to yeah. hear that come from her. Um, so yeah, there was that pressure of, uh, I, I don't, it, it wasn't pressure that anybody deliberately put on me. I think it's just something that I took on. And, um, and, uh, and it's just something that I, that I felt like I needed to do as, as the oldest and, and, and as the son and, and yeah. So I think only afterwards, years later, do you realize what it was and how it was, you know, the framework of it and, and how it all was panning out. But in that moment, you're just doing the best that you can, um, with what's happening around you. So, so yeah, sure. at that stage, I don't think I, I knew that that's what I was doing, but mm looking back you you see it more clearly retrospectively so yeah. you mentioned being a little bit angry and, and that and obviously that can understand that um but you also got into a bit of trouble at school and in actually um failed all four, four terms of yeah. standard seven yeah uh, but yeah. they still passed you how, how did that work it was insane and and and, and, I, and i'll always be grateful um it was dr van den hook that was our was our was our grade our standard head and I mean, I was just, I mean, I, I was just angry. I was just an angry, I think I got into a couple of fights and was just not a nice, just not a nice kid, you know? And, and I even remember with rugby, we, we actually got pulled into our rugby team that year, got pulled into the principal's office. I don't know if you remember, Gareth, we got pulled into Mr. Pike's office and because yeah. we were losing all of our games and he was like, you guys are an embarrassment to the school. You're supposed, <laughs> to, be, you're supposed to be an A team and all this kind of thing. And, and I was just a stupid prop, you know, that just kept getting penalized for diving over the rack. I don't know anything. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, and then I didn't do well at, with school in terms of marks. And uh, I did, I failed all four terms. And uh, she gave me a conditional pass. And, and her words to me was, you've had a tough year, um, but I believe that next year you'll be okay. So I'm, pulling, I'm putting you through. Wow. And, um, and yeah, they pushed me through, thank God, uh, because otherwise I would have been in the same year as my sister. You know, which would yes. have been, that could have been quite a, a catastrophic, you know, who knows how I would have reacted to that, um, you know, being held back and, and then you're in the same year as your younger sister. So um, not, not, nothing against her, obviously, but, but it would have, I think it would have been quite a, a bad thing. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I'll always be grateful for that. Um, but yeah, that's, that was quite a hectic, a hectic year and, and an, an amazing mm. thing that she did because yeah. she, just wow. understood, she understood. And for me, that's one of the, the good old school educators who could, who could look beyond just your marks mm. and go, hey, there's something else going on here that, that we can help with. And that was amazing. Yeah, I remember Dr. Van Hook. It's funny. He's, he's, well, first of all, you talk about that, that rugby, but, but I, I didn't play A-team rugby, but um, I was like B-team for such a long time. I think only in standard nine did I start, sort of start playing. Well, I was always pretty average, to be fair, but like start playing pretty, okay. You were, you, were too, you were too pretty for rugby, man. Yeah, that's true, but yes. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't flip and catch a ball, I'll tell you what. I that's was, why they stuck you on the me. wing. I like, know, oh, sure. Pretty boy on the wing over there. <laughs> that's it, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you get close to the line, maybe do it soon. That <laughs> uh, that's funny, but, but I remember Dr. Van Hook specifically because she was my science teacher in standard uh, eight, or no, no, sorry, standard nine, she was my science teacher and... I don't know why, but, but I hated science in school for some reason. So like I literally did no work, right? She, she literally came to me at the, like, almost the end of the year. And she's like, Gareth, um, let's have a quick look at your science book. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> she's like, you've got a great cover, right? <laughs> but you've only <laughs> filled in the first two books and we've been, we've been like in science for a year, for a year now. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I know. She's like, I think you should, um, give up science um, because you're bringing down the standard average and the class average and taking other subjects. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right. I should. <laughs> yeah. So she obviously had a very caring and understanding side to her, you know, knowing yeah. like what she, how she helped you as you well. Know, it's, it's crazy how you remember things like that. I, I, if I had to walk past her in the street now, I probably, I probably wouldn't recognize her, but mm -hmm. I, I'll never forget what she did and what she said. 
you know, and it was a five minute conversation, but at that stage of my life, it was so important, you know, so I'll always be grateful for, for, for that. For sure. Man. Sometimes you forget yeah. that the, like you say, the teachers, they, she might've seen the change in you from before. You didn't even know she was like a, like had her eye on you. Yeah, and that's probably what a good teacher is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, they are, they're aware of what's happening around beyond, like you said, said earlier, the marks and yeah. how cool is that, that she'd seen maybe, Oh, he was doing okay. And then he went through this really bad patch and mm -hmm. coupled with what's going on at home. Cool. Yeah. I understand what's happening here. She's probably seen it before and given, you know, give someone a chance. It's, it's really, yeah. really actually quite cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we were lucky at that school. We had some really good teachers. Mm. Pike, Mr. Pike was an amazing headmaster. You know, and like you said, you don't you don't, you don't realize that these people are watching you. And, and the same mm. thing happened with Pike. I mean, I remember one day sitting on the side of, standing on the side of the field watching, I don't know if it was a hockey game or a rugby game. And he came and stood next to me and he goes, Hey Dylan. And <laughs> How do you even know my name? Kind of, you know? And it's just amazing. So we were fortunate at that school. You know, it was an amazing school, and we had good teachers. And I think our year, everyone just got along, and and yeah. and uh, we all just, you know, I'm a trick here. Everyone was just friends, and it was it was, a, you know, I have good. Besides those first two years where you know you the, the, you're trying to find your feet, and there's bullying and mm, and yeah. things, and my own anger issues. But but after that, everyone just settles in, and and I'm a trick here. I have really good memories of. Of, of school nice. and, and things like that. So, so yeah, it was, good, it was good times. Yeah, for sure, man. Yes, I do remember Mr. Pike as well. He was the, he was actually my, uh, my ed math teacher and he was flipping the most charismatic guy in classes ever. You, you honestly, you've never, like, you've never been so scared of a person because <laughs> he was the headmaster, but like also so excited to go to one of his classes because yeah, yeah he would just go, he would get really into his maths and like do these equations and stuff. And just like, you almost couldn't wait for his classes because he was, he was really a, an engaging teacher. It's like such an important quality, I think. Yeah. 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 So, so, but I'm um, talking about high school, like your last two years of high school, um, you know, your family did struggle a little bit financially um, and there were tough times for you, but you actually found a little bit of uh, comfort and solitude in, in religion, didn't you? Yeah. So, so one of the things that changed, what that 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 changed, you know, that stem that that between that sort of center five and center eight was, was there was this guy called Thomas Adams, and 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 he used to, he used to every now and then he used to run and he'd like clip me on the back of the head or something or flick my ear and then run off and, and I was like one day I'm going to catch you and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to beat the shit out of you. It's going to happen. He was much bigger than me, but I was like, it's cool. You know, I'll take him. And, um, and then what happened was he did this one break and I ran and I chased him and, and he ran into this classroom and then I ran in to the classroom after him and I'm like, now oh, I'm going to get this guy. And there's this, all these people there praying, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is uh, bad, bad timing. I maybe, <laughs> I maybe shouldn't beat him up now, you know, <laughs> it was the SCA, which was the students Christian association at Foy's and, and uh, they asked me to stick around and, and I, I, I hesitantly stuck around and listened to what they were talking about. And it wasn't so much what they were talking about. It was what they were as a group of people. They seemed to be a group of people that cared about each other, which, you, you know, when, when, when things are going hectic in your, in, your, in your home life, that becomes quite an interesting mm -hmm. thing and a comforting thing and something that you crave. And, um, and then, um, one of the guys in that group invited me to a church uh, called Northcliff Union, and um, and I and I went. And you know there was people that cared. They cared about you, and and they wanted to listen to you. And and uh, it was you know it was a guy there who was the first person that it, that told me I had a good voice and I could sing, kind of thing. And no one had ever told me that before. And uh, and you had this going on. And and they really that sense of community and that sense of togetherness and and people that care about you and really helped me through helped me to get to another phase in my life and get get not be angry anymore and and mm -hmm. see that there's more to life and and that was so so yeah so they, that was a huge um thing and and um it was never really if i look back now and in all honesty it was never really about the the, the christianity thing and the dogma mm -hmm. and uh, it was about the community it was about how it made me feel you know it made mm -hmm. me feel like i was part of something it made me feel welcome and uh, and it was a really good, you know, it was a really good advertisement for for Christianity, and uh, and it was what made me feel like, okay, this is something that can help p 
people and because it, it helped me and uh yeah, yeah so that was a really interesting phase yeah and and I'll, yeah i'll never forget that and again it's not something that i'll i re, i'll change because it, it yeah. made it made it, it yeah it molded me somehow um so so yeah exactly man yeah yeah it's uh you know we i think we must we must almost never regret anything in life because you never know what's going to happen if that didn't happen, you know, or, you know, you avoided that in your life. Like it's yeah. everything happens for whatever reason and it molds us and teaches us lessons and, and defines us and yeah. creates us into the person we are today. So, exactly. so, so, so just talking about like communities and stuff, I mean, we, we couldn't uh, go through this podcast and not talk about our rugby tour that we went yeah. on in, in matric I mean, we could have a whole podcast on that. That's for sure, because it was such an amazing trip. Yeah. But um, we we came, there was thirty five of us, and we came on a rugby tour to the UK in in, in matric, and it was just like it was just an, um, awesome. You know what I mean? But there's there's a particular great story about you. It was our last four days. <laughs> we, we we spent our last four days in in London, and uh, as you can imagine, thirty five oaks in London. Yeah. Something is going to go yes. wrong. You know what I mean. So, yeah. so maybe you want to tell us about what happened with uh, with you the one time. <laughs> so it was yeah, it was the day that we were supposed to fly out, and uh, and we we were going we were walking around London, um, the shops, and and I think it was the this, I don't I don't remember where it was, but it was somewhere around Hyde Park, I think. And we were walking around, and and you know like we had we had a few hours to go and look at some shops and, and do some last minute shopping, and then everyone was supposed to go to St Paul's Cathedral. So they told I, I can't remember the exact time, but they said you guys need to be back at the bus this bus stop at whatever time it was. And I obviously got the times wrong. And and one of the other things that I did wrong was we were supposed to go in groups of three, if you remember, eh, Gareth. Mm. And uh, and I went off on my own. So every now and then I like to just like wander off and do my own thing. And I went off on my own, got to the bus stop, and there's no bus there. Uh, the bus is gone. And I'm like, okay, looking around, looking around. You know, the bus is going to be here. Or I, I, maybe I'm at the wrong bus stop, you mm. know, but it was the same bus that we'd had the whole trip. And then... Um, sort of hung around there, it felt like forever, you know, and you, you know, you're 17 years old, you're like, in London, like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? And, uh, and then I saw, um, dude, it was, it was uh, James Pickering's parents Yeah. were on the other side of the road, because there were these people looking at me and waving, and I didn't know who they were. <laughs> I'm like, who are these people? And then I looked again, and the younger brother of James had a four-way's um, tracksuit top on Shit. before his high school and I'm like wait a minute and then I recognized the brother and I'm like that's Pickering's parents and <laughs> I ran across like four lanes to get to them um, and and they're like I'm like I've missed the bus and then they were helping me find and they were really we were really also going to like get me on a tube and catch a tube to the, to the Heathrow <laughs> and I'm stressing and next minute the bus pulls up and Fuchs, Sean Fuchs is standing at the front of the bus and I'm like, this guy is going to kill me. And I had to explain to everyone what had happened on the microphone on the bus. And uh, we, had cut, we had cut the whole um, St. Paul's Cathedral tour short and oh. uh, uh, because of me, they had cut the oh. whole tour of the St. Paul's Cathedral and uh, I mean, I felt terrible. <laughs> But I was so fucking relieved, man. I was so, I was, so uh, I was relieved until I saw Fuchs's face, and I'm like, oh, I'm dead. This guy's gonna. Be. But uh, it was a great tour. I think that was the first time I got drunk. We got drunk in Dublin. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time I ever got drunk. And uh, we had, I can't remember how many pillow fights and raided dorms. And the one thing I do remember was we stayed in a place called the Generator. That was where we stayed in London. Yeah. <laughs> And there was a group of French history girls on a tour. And obviously, <laughs> so the guys are like, you know, we're going to try to score. And I, I, I'd been, I'd, I had promised a girl back home that I would behave myself. So I was trying to be good and stuff. But I always remember we had that song, Boss Lace. Yeah. The song of the tour, so the Boss Lace was a song about a tick up your asshole. That was the song, <laughs> the song was about. And, and we sang the song to these French girls. And they thought it was our national anthem, and they started singing the French national anthem. And uh, it was, we had some good, we had some good laughs. It was great, and we played some rugby games as well, uh, which was yes, cool. yeah. It was There's something about trip. about tours that are like I don't know, just so much fun. And yeah. there's this camaraderie and this yeah. laughs, like nonstop laughing. Every yeah. tour that I've been on, I just picture how much you laugh at stuff. And you just have that 
a little bit of taste of freedom for that, you know, for yeah. you're obviously still at home, you still have your parents and all that on your yeah, back. And, and, and for a lot of us, it was the first time we ever went overseas mm. or some of the guys was the first time they ever flew in a plane, you know, and so it was a crazy thing. And, and you know, we, we encountered stinging, uh, stinging thistles in Scotland. Remember, we played on that, we played on a rugby field and we, we, a couple of guys slid down the bank and we slid into these stinging thistle things. Yes, they were so, so painful. <laughs> and uh, actually, just, it was just such a great experience, man. It was, yeah, it was, it was good. And we couldn't afford to go. Like, I, like my family, we were struggling at that time. But my, my mom and, and, and my, my mom and my stepdad, they were like, we'll make a plan. Like, you have to go. You have to That's go cool. as well, you know. So it was a great experience. And again, one of those things where you look back and go, flip you know what a great thing my folks did um mm. you know so so yeah it was it was a good it was a good experience that, that's well <laughs> that's so cool. and, and you know talking about the community is as you're mentioning i mean that, that's one thing we can say about religion you know uh there's a lot to be said for it and some not some not so good but that's definitely i think a, a thing that, that can really change someone's life is is feeling like you're part of something yeah and um i'm sure that's that is why a lot of people yeah i think it's the best thing that 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 re organized religion has got going for it you know and i think they take that for granted unfortunately and uh but we'll get into that a bit later as well i suppose yeah. but yeah I, I, for me i think i think that's what you know i i you know obviously i, re I read because i studied theology and um and and i and i and you read a lot of the bible and stuff and for me whether you believe Jesus existed or, or what he did was real and all of these kind of things. I, 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 he wanted a community. He wanted church to be community. That's what he wanted. Mm. To be. You know, he wanted it to be people sitting around uh, at coffee shops or bars today. Like that's how in my mind it would look. And unfortunately most, uh, you know, organized religion hasn't gone that way or isn't that I mm. see some guys try to do it, but I think that's what, you know, to your point, I think it's what, Christianity or religion, organized religion has got going for its community. It's totally. part of something and, and we've got people who care about us and, and are praying for us and things like that. And that, that's, that's something special because you, you know, the world can be a lonely place sometimes. Of course. Yeah. To be on the team, on the same team with someone is, is an amazing feeling. Yeah. So, sorry, so sorry, after, just, just before yeah. you go on, so, sorry, but uh, just uh, maybe you don't want to tap on that thing on the table. Sorry. Just, okay. so, <laughs> just so, making a lot of noise. Yeah, because you would hear it in the editing, that's all. So okay, just okay, say okay. no. Cool. Just, sorry, no but <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. <laughs> so Dylan, after school, you, you actually uh, went to Bible College um, off the back yeah. of, of sort of that experience and, uh, and uh, forming you into that. Yeah. Um, you were the first person under 21 to be accepted and you, um, and you yeah. studied theology. Is that right? Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, my mom always jokes about it. She always jokes that I, that I used to take in, um, you know, all of the, like the, uh, the, the lost souls and stuff at school and the guys had issues. And then, you know, there were guys in our year who, you know, they'd fight with their parents and I would be like, okay, just come and sleep at my house. You know, and my, my mom would be like, there's always, there was always like a, a somebody who a lost soul that Dylan would like take under his wing. And, and uh, so I always had this thing that I wanted to help people. And, and because of my experience of what happened with this group of, 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 of Christians and this, this church, I believe this was the best way that I could possibly do it. And, you know, I had a lot of people saying to me, you should go into ministry and you'd make a good pastor. And, and it was something that I was passionate about. And, and yeah, and uh, the minister of that church, Northcliffe Union, was a guy called Rex Mathy, who, who he's dead now. But he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll have a word with it because they don't take anybody over 21. But I really think, you know, they should make an exception. And it was after it was then that they said, okay, well, I had an interview at the co at the college with the with the with the registrar and with the dean and everything, and they were like, yeah, okay, well, we'll do this. And and then it was after that, that they changed the the rules. And I I looking back now, I, I think maybe they shouldn't have. I think it's it's a young age to be doing something like that. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's a young age to to be wanting to go into ministry where you're responsible for people's you know people's souls as it as it were. And uh, um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, that's an, just an aside, but yeah, I was, I was 18 when I went to, to Bible college and did mm. a degree in, in theology. But I think it says a lot about you though, as a person, but you know what I mean? Like mm. it's obviously you have this kind of 
maybe you say gravitas or presence mm. and um they were like yeah this guy seems like the you know he, he can do it and he can manage it and then it's probably something that, that you've naturally carried with you your whole life yeah maybe i, I think they regretted it in the end because i because i started to ask questions uh, <laughs> yeah. going in and then started to debate with them about things and I don't, no, I don't know if they regretted it, but but yeah, I mean, I, there must have been some reason why they thought it would be a good idea, and and again, grateful that that happened, and 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 no 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 regrets. Uh, you, you, I learned a lot. Yeah, for but, sure. You know, it's interesting though. Like Gareth and I were actually talking about this recently. Is like for like psychology and and these kind of studies, you have to be have some life experience and i and i like you said you when you're in that pastor or a, in that sort of a ministerial position you are taking on the responsibility to some degree of being the the shoulder to cry on or the you know and you have to deal with these things and and maybe you know maybe it's true maybe there there should be a bit of an age thing you have to experience life a little bit before you can become that sort yeah. of person yeah. you know yeah i i agree with that and and i i and I think because it's a big decision and, and, and it's a big commitment and you are under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, I was, I was 18 when I took my first job while I was studying, I took my first job at a, at a church hmm. and you all of a sudden you're responsible for, for 30, 30 teenagers, you know, and, and, you know, crazy things that are going on in your kids getting abused and, and, and sexually yeah. molested and, you know, drugs and things like that. And you're, and you're 18 years old, you know, and you're trying to help and, and guide these kids. And, um, yeah, it, it's, I think it, yeah, there, there, there should be some kind of, um, yeah, you need some kind of life, life, life experience. And, and I didn't have it. And I, you know, winged it a lot and, and it worked out and I'm, and, and I'm glad that I did it. And, but yeah, it's a, it's a hectic responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, talking about like even being young and things happening to, to other people, but also to yourself, where uh, I think it was in 1999, you were 19 years old and you had your first bite of TTP. Um, maybe you can just sort of tell us what that is. I, I, I don't want to butcher the, the full name of it because it's yeah, me, quite a difficult medical name, but maybe you want to tell us what happened and what it, what it actually is. Yeah. So um, I, I should actually, I'm going to have to just, I need to just look up the name quickly. Because it's thro a long. Thro it's thro I've, I've got it here. It's thrombotic okay, so thrombocytopenia purpura. Purpura, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I, I, funny enough, I can never get I can never get the the name right. I always mess it up. Um, so yeah, it's but for short, it's TTP. It's basically a blood clotting disorder. So your platelet count is very very low, um, and that's really what the main problem is with with the with the condition um so what happened was um we went on a on a on a trip uh, with the university to um where was it venda which is up in the north of south mm. africa and i've got tick bite fever mm. and then on the back of the tick bite fever i got a kidney infection and so i went to santon clinic and they were treating me for 10 days for a kidney infection and it just wasn't getting better and then eventually this guy called Dr. Phillips was like, the, we were treating him for the wrong thing. This is something else. And they sent me to Morningside uh, Clinic where there was a guy called Dr. Britton and they, they and, and I had this, and they figured out that I had this TTP. Mm. Um, and my platelet count was, uh, was about 16,000, which it's supposed to be 150,000. So nice. it's quite low. And, um, and I, and then, yeah. And then they, tr they treated it. I was the first time they did the, the dialysis, which basically what it is, is it's this big filtering machine and, and they put you on this machine. You've got a, um, a catheter in your neck. So two pipes in your neck. Um, well, they, they have, they put it very places with mine. They put it in my neck and, uh, they plug you into this machine and your blood goes out the machine. It filters, it goes through a filter. Um, and it takes out all the bad plasma and then they put new plasma in, which is then supposed to kick up your platelet count. Um, and so they did that. And the first time that I had dialysis, I, I actually, my body responded, reacted really badly. And I had a mild stroke, uh, oh, at 19 years old, which is crazy. So it messed up my left eye and, and, and then they had to wait a little bit and then they carried on with the treatment. Jeez. And then, um, what happened was we had, we had medical aid at that stage. 
and um, uh, the medical aide came and visited and they said, and the doctor had said that, um, you know, because it was back then when medical aide comes and checks like that you're actually sick and, and things mm-hmm. like that. And uh, the medical aide came and the doctor had said he's going to be better by such and such a date. And I relapsed. <sighs> And the medical aide went, no, 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 no. You said you'd be better. And they sent me to Helen Joseph, which was JG Stratum Hospital. It's a government yeah. hospital at that station. For, for, for the listeners that don't know, a government hospital in, in South Africa is a very, very scary place. And I uh, got to this place and it was hectic, man. It's like, you know, when you come from, you know, the background that we came from mm-hmm. as these, uh, these, these privileged, privileged kids, you walk into this place and it's the floor, the floors are dirty and they're using old needles and uh, they gave me a private room because I, I can't contract, you know, your immune system is so low and everything with this disease. And so they gave me a private room. I went to the toilet. I came back and there's some dude lying in my bed and they're like, no. okay, now we're going to put you in a public ward. And uh, that night um, I didn't really sleep much because the, the lights were on the whole night and they Jeez. putting people in and out of the rooms and, my dad came to us and he's like, we're getting you out of here. You can't stay in this, in this, Good Lord. this hospital. And the next day we checked ourselves out and the, the guy said to me, listen, if anything happens to you while you're out, there's not, you know, there's nothing we can do. And, and, and my dad just said, no ways, you know, we, we, you, we've got to check you out. And, uh, and I, we left and luckily I got, uh, luckily I'd, uh, I was already better. And, and, and I didn't, I didn't have any problems after that for another three years. Hmm. So yeah, Lord. it was quite a hectic uh, experience. Cheap as yeah. can, can you tell us a little bit about that mild stroke that you had like was it did you feel something happening do you it was very it, yeah it was very um i don't remember much of it craig um basically what i remember was I, they had done the they did the dialysis i i wasn't feeling well i got up and i went to the to the to the bathroom and i locked myself in the bathroom and i proceeded to just throw up and then i passed out um, on the floor and and then i and then um I, <laughs> that I kept trying to escape that night I kept trying to escape from the from the hospital <laughs> so mm-hmm. there was one stage where I do remember all the lights are out in the passageway and I'm busy leopard crawling down the, the <laughs> wow. passageway and they're chasing me with torches wow. and, and I thought I was being like detained by the church of Christ people or something and and uh, yeah, so that's what I really remember about that. And then, and then that, that and, I, and I bled a lot. And I was bleeding from my nose quite a bit. So they had to put these like hectic hard plugs up my nose. Um, and you woke up the next morning and then they've got to pull these plugs out of your nose. And uh, so that, that's kind of what I, it was very blurry, but, but yeah, yeah. Um, there wasn't like a pain in my chest. And so it wasn't kind of like, okay, I, I feel like my, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, that stiffness in the arms or a pain in the chest, mm-hmm. but it was just a really bad reaction passed out. And, and then they were like, yeah, so you had a mild stroke last night is basically wow. what happened to you. Um, which is why yeah. everything was so like in a dwell and I didn't really know where I yeah. was and, and all of that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that. crazy, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, Helen Joseph must've been just another experience. And, you know, yeah. it, we, we got to take our head off to the people that do work there and the people that are, trying their best it's just underfunded yeah i mean uh, over overpopulated yeah, i mean i felt bad because you know you, you're speaking to like a nurse or a doctor and and and, and they're saying to me we know how bad it is like we know this is yeah. bad you know we know this is not a good hospital we know the conditions are really bad here but we're doing the best we can mm. you know and i just stay positive and, and just sort of you know um my father still talks about it because he, he phoned me and he's like so how is it and i'm like oh it's not so bad and then he came to the hospital and he was like wow. you oversold you oversold the hospital you know <laughs> um so so i just try to stay positive and i and i and i wrote and i and i listened to music and and um tried to just sort of keep keep a, a positive mindset while i was there but yeah it was quite a scary place to be for a for a 19 year old uh yeah. it comes from foys you know <laughs> yeah, for sure man Jeez. yeah and uh so dylan at uh at some stage you actually started questioning religion a little bit and uh the more you studied uh the, the scriptures the more sort of questions you had what sort of happened there yeah so you know you're always taught in 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 in, in christianity and in christianity that we sort of understood in south africa protestant christianity uh, that that the Bible's black and white, and you can't really question it because it's the Word of God, and and this is how it is, and 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 everyone who doesn't believe in this book is wrong, and they're going to hell, and everyone who does is, is got a ticket to heaven, 
you know. So that's mm. kind of what you go into Bible college with this. This is the mindset. This is the the framework, and um, and then you start studying things, and you're like, I don't really like that. Like, I don't dig that, you know. And then and then you start having questions, you know. And, and then you're having like we ha- would have, you know, we'd have systematic theology was one of our lectures where you really get stuck into the real scriptures and what they mean in Greek and in the original languages and Hebrew, and you start to go, okay, so that's the original translation. That's the literal translation. Why are we teaching this? You know, why are we, and then you, then you start to go, but this was thousands of years ago in a culture that was complete, that's completely different to the one we're in today, written by a guy, you know, not, this is not, this was written by a normal person like you and I, Mm. uh, who was supposedly inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's great, but he's still just an average man. Mm. Why is it right? And why is everybody else wrong? You know, like this is when you start to, and you know, once you leave school, you, you get exposed to different types of people and different cultures and you meet really nice Muslims, you know, and you meet really nice Hindus and you start going, but I don't want this guy to go to hell. You know, why is he going to hell? He's a totally. person, you know, and, and then you've got family members in your, who are gay and, and, and the church is like, no, gay, being gay is a sin. And you're like, but why would God make someone like that if, if it's so bad, you know, because, you know, every gay person that I know, they, they weren't, they didn't wake up one day and went, okay, I'm going to start having sex with men. They just, you know, it, it was who they were from the beginning. And, and, and um, why would God make someone like that? And so all these questions started coming up. And I remember once being called a heretic at college because, mm. um, because what happened was we we're talking about missions. So all these, you know, going out and, and, and telling people about the word of God and, and going to these like jungles in the Amazon and, and telling people about God, because if they don't hear about God and if they don't profess to, to, to follow Jesus, they're going to go to hell. So the, mm-hmm. the mission of the church is to go out and spread the word. And I'm like, but what about the guy who never gets to hear? Is it fair then that he, that he doesn't go to heaven? That doesn't sound right to me. And uh, I was like, so surely he gets a second chance or he gets a free pass or something. And, this, and, and my missions lecture was like, no, that's heresy. And you need to leave. Wow. I'm like, okay, and I, and I left. And and the same thing happened. We got into a, we got into the um, got into a big debate at college about the gay the gay thing. And I was like, but why would God make somebody gay if it's so wrong? Yes. And uh, I got got kicked out as well for that. And 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 so yeah, it was all that was all at that stage where I started to question things. And and um, and you know, you look at things and you go, this is very much cultural culturally specific to that time you know things in 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 the bible were, you know, like that's specific to the to this time you know there's there's stuff in in the bible about where it says things like women should be kept silent you know uh, mm. in the book of paul i think it is or i mean in the book of romans sorry and and the there's churches that have taken that and made it mean that women can't lead and women can't stand up and preach in church and i was like but that's not what that was saying what was mm. happening in that community was people were very wealthy. The woman was standing around gossiping and causing shit in the community. And Paul was saying to these women, you need to keep quiet. And mm. that's what it was about. It wasn't yeah. about women can't lead and women can't preach, but certain Baptist churches and very conservative churches took that to mean women can't lead. And I'm like, but that's not what that is. It's, it's for a different culture and a different time. And it doesn't apply to us. And uh, that was when I started to to really question, and, and it's it's a very confusing book. You know, the God of the Old Testament versus the yeah. God of the New Testament. You're like, these aren't. This isn't the same person. You know, and and that was when things started to change for me. When I started to question things, I, I still stayed in church, and I still, you know, I still, even though I couldn't marry things, certain things, and I couldn't come to terms with certain things, and um, come with, come to terms with certain, certain aspects of Christianity, but I still believed it was something that I could do good and help and, and help people. And so I stuck, yeah. I stuck it out a little bit longer. But it's so interesting, like hearing from somebody who's actually studied it. So like th- this, yeah. this is what I remember for, this was like one of those first things that we were talking at that dinner that I spoke about at the start. And I was like, yes, this is just fascinating. Like listening to somebody who's actually studied theology and then gone, hang on what's going on here? Like <laughs> it yeah. says one thing. Yeah. But then you kind of like doing another thing and uh, you yeah. kind of like, you know, maybe misinterpreted it or just kind of, you know, change your, your thinking of it. So it's really, really fascinating. But, but there was the straw that, 
broke the camel's back, wasn't there? So you were, yeah. I think you were, from memory, you said you were sort of being primed to be like the, the main uh, pastor or minister of a church. Um, and there was a specific um, meeting where you were uh, told by the elders of the church to um, tell the pastor at the time that he basically wasn't doing things properly and he kind of needed to go something along those lines is that right yeah, yeah. so i was the youth pastor of of the church and um I, i'm not going to like use names and things like no, that no hmm. no but but because I, I just don't want to it's not something i'm angry about or anything but um so i was the youth pastor of this church and and we were doing really well we we um we we, we went from having about 30 kids coming through the door to around, I think it was close to 200 over a week. Mm. We had them coming through the gates of the church and we had a skate park. We managed to get funding from private, from, from businessmen, from local businessmen for a basketball court, uh, a six side football pitch, a BMX track. And so we had all these kids coming through to, and we had, you know, we had um, guys working, um, on teams. So we had guys who could skate and they were skating with the kids and then talking to them about God and stuff and the footballers and the basketball and the BMX and everything. And, and we had bands coming to play on, on Friday nights and things like that. And, um, the, the basically for people that don't know, elders are, um, appointed by the, the church as leaders of the church. So they work, they're supposed to work alongside the pastor of the church. So the pastors paid, the elders aren't paid, they're volunteers, but they're leaders, they're essentially leaders of the church. And these are guys that are, well, the, these guys that were the elders at this church were successful businessmen, a couple of millionaires, um, guys in their fifties, you know, men, grown men. And I'm at this stage, 20, 22, 23, somewhere around there. Mm. And um, I had a couple of chats to them and they wanted to, all of them, well, a lot of them wanted to revolve, make the church more angled towards the youth because that's where we were having success, uh, according to mm. them. So they wanted to make it more youth centric, essentially, and, and plow all of the resources and, and leadership and everything, put everything behind this movement with all these young people coming in and out. And uh, this guy, the pastor who had been there, I mean, he was a good, he was a nice guy and I liked him a lot, but you know, he was been there for a long time and got things that got a bit stale. Um, you know, it was the same thing over and over. He didn't want things to change. He didn't want to grow. Uh, he didn't really want the church to grow. Well, that's how it appeared. And these guys basically said to me, so we want to fire him, um, but we're going to have a meeting and we want you to bring it up. We want you to, 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 insti to, to, to start the conversation and essentially say to, to this guy, listen, you're not doing the job you're supposed to be and we think you should leave. And then they were all going to jump in and back me up. And, hmm. and uh, that's what's supposed to happen. So it came along and I mean, I wasn't looking forward to it, you know, in, you know, getting the ball rolling on somebody losing their job, you know, yeah. it's not what you want to do, but I, I did think it was the right thing. And I did think that the guy, what, you know, I think things had got stale and, and that the, there was a different direction that would have been better. And uh, so I said, listen, I think you've been here too long and, and some of the ideas are stale and, and I think um, I like you. It's nothing personal, but I think that we need to go in another direction and I think you should look at doing something else and you should consider stepping down. And these guys all just kept quiet. Yes. Oh, they, they didn't say a word. And I was just left to hang out, hang out to dry. And the pastor said, sorry, does anybody agree with Dylan? And these guys no ways. kept quiet. And uh, yeah, I left that meeting, got into the car, um, and my 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 phone. I think it was my dad, and I just said, I, "I'm done. Like I'm I'm done. I'm out." And uh, and these guys tried to call me for a couple of days afterwards, and I don't know why they wanted to speak. And a couple of the these elders, and I, I I just didn't have didn't want to speak to them anymore. And and that was it, you know. And I left. I, I resigned the next day, and. Uh, and that, that was crazy. I mean, the minute that I left, like left the ministry uh, in inverted commas, um, a lot of my friends just stopped talking to me um, because I, I had, you know, I had slidden into the pits of hell or something because yeah, I, yes. I left the church. 
Uh, one of them was even my, my one of my best friends. I was best man at his wedding, and, and he just flat out stopped talking to me. And yeah, it was it was quite hectic. He got called things like the Antichrist, and it was no it was ways. Hectic. Yeah, it was hectic. It was, uh, it was crazy, crazy time. Wow. Yes, it's bad. It's yesterday, that's nuts, man. Yeah. Yes, and that, that you know you they've pushed you into the situation, and you got the you got the the bravado now you've got the support and then just to drop you like that hey like how crazy and i mean this is one thing that i experienced in religion um this is just my experience is like exactly what you said is is the sort of hypocrisy sometimes like if you care for me like yeah you can't shun me because i've going through a tough time that's when maybe you should be there more for me if if that's really what it's all about, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, I, I, 100%. Uh, I mean, that that was one of the things that I, you know, the deeper you go into ministry and 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 involved in church, you see some really horrible things done to people in the name of religion, you know. And I'm like, that's not what I signed up for, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and you, you, that was exactly it. Craig was, I'm like, this is not what it's supposed to be like, you know, and it's uh, one of the things that I remember a, 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 an ex baptist the ex, one of the ex heads of the Baptist church, he resigned from as head of the Baptist, the whole Baptist like conglomerate of churches in South Africa. And his final speech was, um, many of you have been asking questions about why I'm resigning and, and all these kind of things. He goes, the church is the only institution that shoots its wounded. <laughs> and mm. I was like, whoa, that's no ways that's that's but that's nail on the head because you don't believe what i what i believe you don't go to church every sunday uh you're weak you're done you know and that's what church for me you started to look at i was like it's this exclusive group of people who you know believe they're right and everybody else is wrong and those others that are wrong are going to hell and i was like i can't i can't Mm. can't. who am i to say that that you know buddhism is wrong or or Catholicism is wrong, or you know, Hinduism is wrong, or who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I to make that decision? You know, mm-hmm. and I just I, I couldn't I couldn't stomach it anymore. And and on the back of that, uh, a friend of mine and I we we went and we started a like an arts church because we still believed and we still wanted to do ministry, I suppose. Mm. And um, we started a, a an arts church, and then that just progressed to. Uh, different things and we went in our own different directions and and so yeah that was that was the sort of the story the main story there (laughs) before we we speak about that that sort of arts church which i'd I'd like to hear more about obviously but i'd like to understand when when you're doing the youth outreach stuff like with the skate parks and all that Mm. is is the underlying intention there to get people into the church or is it to be more like a youth outreach in terms of helping kids that are in trouble or things like that? Or is it both? Yeah, it's, you know, I think the underlying concept, the underlying, the underlying mission is to convert, you know, that Mm. was, but this is where it became a bit of a dichotomy for me was because I was like, but we're helping them already just by being there for them, you know, just by getting them, by getting them off the street by providing them with new friends, by providing them with a person, an older person that they can speak to. Uh, why do we need to still push them to change, you know, the way they think about things or, um, and that was always the, the struggle for me was, because again, I was just like, but why, why is this person mm-hmm. going to hell? Why is this person going to, yeah. you know, you meet people who are supposed to supposedly going to hell and they're better than the people that you, they're better people. They're, they're nicer people than the people that you go to church with. And you're like, this doesn't make sense, you know? And uh, yeah, so, so the end goal was, you know, to convert, to, to kind of like get them to come down the rabbit hole, I suppose, is yeah. you know, that kind of concept. Um, but that was where the struggle was for me, where I was looking, going, but why, why do I need to do that? Because, you know, at the base of it, I was like, but I'm not too sure if I buy into the whole premise that everybody yeah. who doesn't believe the same thing we believe is, is going to help. Um, so, yeah. So that was where the struggle was for me. Personally. Mm. Yeah. Totally understand. Yeah. 
So, um, so tell us a little bit more about the arts. What, what do you mean by sort of an arts church and um, you yes. know, so, creativity? And, and also, actually, you yeah. also spoke about a philosophy group. So maybe just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we, we, we kind of wanted to, we still wanted to have a church, but we wanted to have it look completely different to organized church that we had just sort of left. Because organized church is you come there, you sing a couple of songs, um, uh, they play a very inspirational song and they pass around a, 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 a velvet sack and you put money in and then, and then, uh, and if it's Rayma, they'll ask you to pass it around again because there's not enough. Yeah. This time. <laughs> um, that happens. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, no and, then, and then there's a, and then the pastor gets up and preaches and, and, and then you pray at the end and that's the recipe, you know? And um, we were like, it's so irrelevant. Like it's so, it's so foreign to what, is going to really help people and touch people and, 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 and possibly, you know, because you want to think that's going to impact people. That's how you think as a, as a, as a pastor or as someone who wants to help people find God. And, um, and so we were like, let's get something and centered around the arts. So we rented out this tiny little, this tiny little room in, in Melville above a mug and bean. <laughs> and uh, we set it up. We, we bought speakers and we, we put bean bags and, sofas in it and we had a little stage in the corner and we had live music poetry philosophy discussions every, so every night was something different and then and then it basically got to a point where i was no longer doing it for religious reasons i was just doing it because it was fun because it was awesome and because you were meeting new people and there was a place for people to go and the music the musicians that we had come through were really really good the poetry people that came and read poetry were, it was just wow. phenomenal. Uh, we had a really amazing philosophy, English film study, things like that. And and the the, the other guy that went with me, um, uh, he who started with me, he was still wanting to do it, and a couple of other guys still wanted to do it for religious reasons, and you know use those as an entry point to what I felt was irrelevant and 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 and, and yeah. And so we parted ways eventually, and, and I just eventually stayed with the place for a, a little while longer. And eventually, before I moved to Portugal, closed 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 the doors. But that was a great, that was a lot of fun, and, and I met re some really good people yeah. um, through that. And uh, it was it was it was a good time. Yeah, that's super cool, man. And like you said earlier on, no, uh, there's that theme of you just wanting to be there to help people, you know what I mean? And like, uh, it's, it's really, really cool, but it's, um, it's such a great trait to have. And it, it's so obvious, you know, even this in these days, like, you know, when, it, when you're around you, that's, that's something that you kind of treasure and you just sort of take on naturally. Um, you mentioned uh, just now that the TTP came back and, yeah. you know, uh, what actually happened when it when it came back and we relapsed? So it was two thousand and two. So I was still I was still involved in church at that stage. Um, and basically, what happened was I'd had a couple of operations done on my coccyx. You know, um, uh, and and I think it was the third. It was the third operation, if I if I remember correctly. And it was a guy from Flora Clinic who did the op. Uh, Flora Clinics on the West Rand in, in Johannesburg. And um, I had said to the guy, listen, I've got TTP. You need to check my blood count before you do the operation. And he never did. Hmm. Oh. And it turned out that my platelet count had been a bit low. So what happened was he did the op and the wound didn't heal properly. And the wound went, went septic. Hmm. And the septicemia triggered off the TTP. Because that's the problem with TTP is, is that uh, they don't know what triggers it off. So the first time it was the kidney infection. This time it was the, this time it was the, 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 the infection, the septicemia. So that time was even worse um, when I, um, when my plate account was very low. It was around, I think it, it was 10,000 this time, yeah. around, which was really low. And they got me into ICU. And before they took me to ICU, I was in a ward because what basically what happened was I'd had the op and, and they re, and I went home, and I was feeling really tired and and um, and then I, and then I got up and I got off the bed and there was just blood everywhere. Um, and then I was like, okay, I need to, and I ran a bath and I got in the bath and the bath got all red and I couldn't stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. This is bad news. And they took me to the hospital. They stuck me in a ward. I said, listen, I know what's wrong with me. You need to phone a guy called Dr. Britton. He's at Morningside Clinic. 
And this is one of those things where like the stars are aligned. Uh, they said, oh no, Dr. Britton, he's just opened up the oncology center right here at Flora Clinic. Huh. And five minutes later, he was in my room. No he way. Hey, hey, Dylan, how's it going? Wow. And, uh, I was like, okay, we've been here before. Let's, <laughs> let's do this again, you know? And, uh, and he was, he, he, he was a really, really good doctor. And, and he always used to say, um, he was, he always used to laugh because he said, you know, you're the, you're the only patient who asks me how I'm doing. Cause he would <laughs> come and go, Dill, how are you doing? I'll go, I'm doing good. How are you? And he, he's like, no one does that, you know, but, wow. uh, but he was a great doctor. And, 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 and again, one of those moments where you just like so grateful for how it worked out. And, um, and then, yeah, I did, I did more dialysis. I did this time around because my red blood cell count was really high. <clears throat> I had to do chemotherapy as well. Um, so I would have to do dialysis and then go straight to the oncology center and do chemo in, in one day. And that was quite exhausting. I didn't, yeah. have, I didn't have any terribly bad reactions this time around um, besides, you know, the occasional fever or, or, or shakes and things like that. But, but other than that, you know, I handled it pretty well and, and then had to do it as an outpatient for a little while and still had these pipes in my neck and uh, had a little bit of fun with that. You know, I'd go to like stairs <laughs> and uh, I'd order a double cheese and I'd say, can you liquidate it so that I can put it in my pipes? And the <laughs> person would be like, oh, fuck, I don't know what to do. And I'd be like, I'm just joking. I can still eat a hamburger. You know? uh, that's funny. That's, liqu- it. <laughs> that's so funny, man. Yes, but, it's um, good. <laughs> but, yeah, that, was, that, was the second, that was the second bout of, of TTP. Uh, and that was quite hectic because they were basically, at that stage, my mom and stepdad were overseas. And um, they were basically... Oh, no at one stage they were like listen you need to you need to tell them to come over because he's, he's not going to make it and, oh, wow. and the thing for me was I, I never believed that I was going to die I never I never you know I, I knew that it was bad and you know that it's bad because of other people's reactions you know so when yeah. people are visiting you in hospital and they're standing at the foot of your bed bawling their eyes out you're like okay I must yeah. look pretty I must look pretty shitty you know um yeah. so 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 yeah I knew it was bad but I never believed I never ever believed that I was that I wouldn't pull through. Um, was yeah. was really what 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 happened then? Yes, wow. that's hectic. Yes, well. You know, it's interesting there as well. I mean, look, it's, it's so many hectic things there, but um, just a small thing that stood out was that the doctor. You know, you you forget. You just see these people as these like almost like machines. You know, they just go go and they yeah. and they're amazing and what have you, but. Um, and they do a lot of amazing work, but you forget that they're just people at the end of the day. And yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, just asking how they're doing is, is quite an interesting thing that you just, you did, like you said, you wouldn't have real thought about that necessarily. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I suppose, I don't know if it was, I, I do, it definitely wasn't something that I thought about doing like, okay, let me, let me let get this guy on my side kind of thing. I think uh, it was just, that's just how it was frame totally. so why it's just you know someone asks you how you're doing you also ask them how they're doing even if you're yeah. in a hospital bed you know yeah stealing my biltong though and that that was that was wrong because i wasn't like <laughs> biltong and people would bring you biltong and he'd be like dylan you can't you can't have that i'll just take that off your hands the guy would steal my biltong uh-huh. so so that's that's the one problem that i had with the guy yeah. <laughs> yes and if there's one thing you don't do in south africa is you don't steal another oak biltong but yes no, no, that's no. that's big time <laughs> okay so 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 diane we, my folks were in um there's a there's a place down in the, in the algarve here in portugal where there's an african store and they make bultong so my folks were down in the algarve they brought up some bultong but i can't eat it right now because i'm not having any raw meat um yeah. because of this bacterial problem and um so uh so but then there was dro- there was dry horse, so that's better because it's cured and it's so diane takes some of it out of the freezer this evening she puts it out on the on the on the kitchen counter for me uh, next minute, the girls walk in without even saying anything, and they chow the bolt on. <sighs> oh, like, devastating! How I, like I wanted to cry. Like, no <laughs> way! <laughs> yes. Luckily, oh, still, luckily, there was still another piece, but uh, those little girls stole my bolt on. So, yes. The- good thing I love them so much; otherwise, they would have been bloodshed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Oh, Dylan. So, 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 Dylan. After that, I mean, you actually uh, ev- eventually you ended up as a teacher in a primary school for a year. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so basically it was, you know, I, 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 you kind of leave the church and, and, and then you kind of like, what, what do I do now? You know, like, I don't want to go back and work in a church. Uh, I've got this degree in theology. 
like what the fuck do I do? <laughs> like, what do, yeah. I do with it? You know, so um, I met. I'm trying to think how this happened, but I can't, I can't remember. But I started working for a company called Playball, and it was basically a, a company that um, nursery schools hire to go in and you work with the kids from ages all the, from three all the way up until five. Um, you help with them with gross motor skills and, mm. and, and hand-eye coordination. You play games and there's even a little play ball dance that you do with the kids at the end. And uh, I did that. And then that, and then the people that I was working for, they, they didn't run the business very well and, and, and they basically had to let everybody go. And then I was like, okay, what do I do now? And one of the, 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 the girls, one of the, the ladies that used to come to the music lounge and sing, uh, she knew another company that was called Active Education or Active Ed. And they did a similar thing, but in primary schools. Uh, so basically how it worked was um, schools where, because obviously, you know, over time in South Africa, we had less and less male teachers. So you've got less and less guys who can, you know, teachers that can coach football and athletics and swimming and, and less and less teachers that could coach sports. And um, so what they would do is they would bring in Active Ed and Active Ed would provide the school with three coaches. And you'd go and you'd coach athletics, football, you'd do PE mm. classes and things like that. And then what happened was one of the days they said to me, I was just sitting around because we didn't have a, a class on with and, and they said to me, would you mind substituting for one of the geography teachers who, who's ill? Uh, all you have to do is just go and sit and make sure the kids don't kill each other. And, and uh, <laughs> so I went and I sat in the class and, and, and then while I was sitting there, I looked on the desk and there was this lesson plan. And I'm like, I can teach that, you know, so I'm like, Listen, I want me to save you guys some time. Uh, let's go through this lesson. And we did the lesson and, and I really enjoyed it. And uh -huh. I was like, maybe teaching is an option, you know? And um, one of my teachers who taught me at Charity Primary when I was uh, seven or eight years old, he was the principal now at that stage, he was the principal at Rosebank Primary. Uh -huh. Wow. And he had happened to say to my cousin who worked at Rosebank Farm, he said, what's Dylan up to these days? And she said, well, he's working for Active Ed, but, you know, he's, he's, he's possibly looking for other options. And he said, well, tell him to come and see me. And I went and I saw him and we sat down for 15 minutes and he said, how would you like to come and teach grade six um, social science, which was geography and history and English? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, yeah. but then I went and I taught at, at Rosebank Primary School, which that was awesome. I loved it every moment. Wow. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> cool, I can imagine you're, you're a great teacher. I can imagine that like, the kids really listen, but uh, they're maybe a bit scared of you as well. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning, at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. At the, I mean, at the beginning, I was really strict. And my theory was, you know, let's get some, let's get some boundaries down now, you know, <laughs> and let's, let's do it really, let me do it, let me go hardcore on this. And then after that, once the kids know where, where the boundaries are and what they can and can't do, then we'll, then we'll have, then we'll have a good time. And worked out that way actually it was, it was good I, I really enjoyed teaching it was fun That's there was fun. no caning no no <laughs> I, 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 I cannot confirm or deny <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no there was no caning there was no caning. <laughs> I uh, just confirmed that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but look, so so w once again, like there's this massive feeling of, uh, you know, bravery and courageousness and resilience, I think, as well throughout your whole story. Um, and, and quite a while ago, um, you know, like many, many years ago, you actually decided to leave South Africa mm -hmm. and move to Portugal where your mom and your stepdad had actually started living and, and set up yeah. a business. So, yeah, maybe you want to take us through that journey. Yeah, so so they they... They they had, they had got fed up with South Africa quite early um, on, and and it was their plan to always kind of leave. Um, you know, you get you get you you get you get exposed to crime and things like that, and, and you get to a point where it's time to go. Unfortunately, it's a story for a lot of South Africans. And and they first went to uh, Caribbean, and then they ended up in Madeira which is an island just off the coast of, of, of a Portuguese island. And then they moved to mainland. And obviously I'd visited them quite a few times through to all these places and, and, and visited them in Portugal and really liked Portugal. But I was always very patriotic. I was like, I'm never leaving South Africa. Mm. There's a guy who we went to school with, Gareth, uh, Fernando Policarpo. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember and, him well. And F Fernando's a Portuguese guy. And, and Fernando was always like, I'm going to live in Portugal one day. And I always we used to sit in, together in, I think it was history. 
And I say, no ways, I'm never leaving South Africa. <laughs> and, uh, and one day, Fernando um, came to, to Portugal and we met each other for a <laughs> drink one night. And he was standing on the other side of the road and I was standing on the, the other side. And he was like, fuck you. You always said you would never leave South Africa. And now, you, and now you're living in Portugal and I'm still stuck in that shit. <laughs> so, yeah, it was funny. Oh, but, wow. funny but, um, but yeah, so my folks moved and, and, um, and I was, you know, I was never, I, I mean, I was always very really clear in no ways. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to move to Portugal, you know, and I'm going to stay here. And then, yeah, you know, things happen and, and you get older and you start to look and go, where's the future? What's, you know, where's, where's this going? You know, and also at an educational level, you see South Africa at the grassroots and you're like, this is not good. You know, this is, this is, this is, uh, where's the, w w what kind of future have I got here? And the only thing really keeping me in South Africa at that stage was a relationship that I was in and, and it ended badly. And, um, and I was like, and my stepdad and I had had a couple of discussions about me moving across there and, and working with, with him. And, um, and then, yeah, this relationship ended and I thought maybe I should give it a try, you know, and my father was very, always very encouraging about, you know, going overseas and, mm -hmm. and, and, and because he felt there was a better opportunity there for, for us for me and uh and that was it and 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 i went and uh and moved yeah packed up packed up everything and and, and went went to portugal in two uh in 2009 hmm. yeah cool yeah. man that's yes. crazy man and it must have been a massive adjustment culturally and you didn't even uh, speak the language to begin with yeah, I only knew how to to kind of ask for a beer and say thank you and 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 things like that. So, so yeah, I didn't speak the language. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think I think as South Africans, we are sometimes quite ignorant, and and we go into other places thinking, you know, I'm just going to dominate. You know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rule the place, or I'm just gonna succeed. And and you go there, and you. You know, and also Portugal, and you know, Portugal's got the stigma of like it's a poor country, and people are a bit stupid, and and you know, I mean, there's a Facebook group of of Americans living in Portugal, and you see some of the things that they ask. You know, these Americans that before they've come, they're like, are there cars for sale in Portugal? And you're like, no, everyone rides around yes. on donkeys. You know? <laughs> but, but, but 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 you know, you, you Portugal always had the stigma of it's 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 not it's a bit of a backward place, and and then you get here, and you're like. It's a first world country. You know, fine, they've got old school values and and there's this tradition and culture that's such a beautiful thing. But they switched on and they know what they're doing. And you 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 know and you and you go there as a cocky South African and and it doesn't work out the way you think mm. it's going to work out. And you have to eat a bit of humble pie, and almost go okay. I know nothing, and let me let me know my place here in the in the pecking order of things. And and yeah, and I was just I stubbornly decided I will learn the language. I will learn how to speak this language. Even if people think, even if I sound like a six year old, as long as they understand what I'm asking and what, what I'm saying, then, then I'm okay with that. And I suppose that not being afraid of what people thought think is, is the key to learning a language because mm -hmm. you, you can't care that you sound like an idiot, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to be fair in Portugal, they, they're not like that. They don't ridicule you for, for speaking their language badly and they, they are patient and they almost too polite. They don't want to correct you in case they offend you. And, and so that was a really beautiful thing about, about cultural, but yeah, it was a cultural, a big cultural difference um, to, to what we're used to in South Africa as a place and people and, and, and things like that. Others, mm -hmm. there are similarities as well at the same time. So there was things that, that, that are comforting about it. Um, and, and having family here really helped. I wouldn't have been able to do it without my family. My sister was here and my mom and my stepdad. And I wouldn't have been able to cope if it wasn't for them. Um, well, I mean, maybe I would have, but I, luckily I didn't have to go through that without them. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it was, it was a challenge, the cultural, the cultural and, and the language. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I'm, not, I'm still not fluent yet. Uh, if you if you had to ever speak to Diane, there are many lost in translation moments. Um, <laughs> and still get things wrong. So so yeah, it's it's uh, it's a challenge. But but it's 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 again best decision best decision I ever made was moving here. It's oh, been cool, a wonderful experience. Amazing. That's great, bud. Yeah. Well, well, I look forward to obviously joining you in, in just over sort of six months, bud. And you'll have a, a two-year-old to speak to so we can enjoy 
Yeah, I know you've progressed from the six-year-old Portuguese, so you can yeah. your old <laughs> Portuguese buddy to speak to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel so bad, but that's for sure. <laughs> um, okay. so, did you? It's it's a massive thing learning a new language. I think you said the right thing is just like get over yourself. It's okay. People appreciate it. Like, yeah. you know, that, that you're trying and yeah. always think that people are judging you, but actually it's the direct opposite. So yeah. you know, for anyone listening is just like, go keep going, you know, like you get there. Did you guys ever go to um, Lesito land in uh... Lesito land? Yeah. 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 Um, actually, I, was, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I was actually playing. Um, I was playing football at one stage for, I don't know if, I can't remember if it was Randberg or Panorama football club. And, and we were playing on a football pitch and uh, um, the game was went to penalties. And so I can't remember how long it went on for, but there were all these cars parked outside because they were using that uh, football pitch for the parking lot for Lucita Land. And all <laughs> these cars were parked at the gate, hooting for us to finish the game <laughs> so that they could park for Lucita Land. But John, yes. Lucita Land was, was, was good. Yeah, I remember I moved up from PE and I didn't know any Portuguese people in PE. And then I, when I moved up there, I made some Portuguese mates and they're like, I'm going to Lusita land. And, um, those caparinhas that, uh, that yeah. it's like sugary, yeah. uh, with yeah, the, kis, like a kishasa or something. Yeah, isn't it? I don't know how you yeah, say yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, black, it's black vodka, brown sugar, lime. It's very sweet, so it's deceiving because you yes. just gulp the stuff down, and then before you know it, you've got a you got you 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 you're swaying. The world yes. is swaying a little bit. Yeah, it's dangerous. Oh, it's pretty strong stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 but uh, talking about the adjustments and everything, you you actually started working for the family business, and yeah. you you had to start at the bottom, um, because it was a property business. I guess you hadn't really worked in in that sort of stuff. So, what what was that like for you? Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was, it was tough. Um, you know, your I didn't really have a clue what I was doing at the beginning, you know, and, and you kind of have to learn from scratch. And, um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was difficult. You know, my, my, my stepdad, um, he, he would, you know, he's tough on us, uh, he, but, but it all comes from a good place. You know, he wants the best for us and and so he was you know i would say at times he was tougher on us than what he was on on, on the other staff you know and um and yeah i had to start just i had to start by learning from the other people the, the other the other my other colleagues that were there and and again the language thing and 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 learning a whole new a whole new business but he was always confident that that i could succeed in in sales um and i suppose you know, again, sales has always got this really bad stigma attached to it. You know, the greasy, the greasy head salesman, you know, the car salesman or things like that. And I suppose I've always fought against that idea that, no, well, I'm not a salesman. And, and, and then one of the things that kind of stuck for me was, okay, but I've been, I'd, I'd been selling religion mm -hmm. and very well. And, and so actually yeah. I suppose I can sell anything. And, uh, and yeah, and then, and then just basically once I got to the point where I was like, I need to take ownership of this, you know, I need to take responsibility for this and, and for myself, it's a, I chose to come here. Uh, there's no one else to blame for, 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 for my struggles or for not being able to succeed. It's all on me. And once I sort of got to that stage, uh, then, then, then it really, you know, it really got better and, 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 and it's been, and it's been good. It's been, it's been a good journey. Mm -hmm. for sure but yeah, i think uh, one thing that's important to always remember is that we we are sales people throughout our whole life with yeah. with everything we do really is you know you're projecting something to exactly, other people yeah. one way or another and um you know why not do it well and with it with some ethics and and all these things and um but still do it well you know so it's good exactly. to learn so the money wasn't that amazing at the time. Um, so you were also playing music and singing in bars around Portugal. Yeah. So it it was it was also the recession. Um, so that was a good time to learn the business. But yeah, it was it was I wasn't making I was you know I, was, I, I wasn't making uh, uh, good money. Um, and so for a pocket money on the side, I, I would go and I'd play I'd play music. I had my guitar with me and and. I'd go and play some music in, in, in bars on weekends and make a little bit extra. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And, and one of the mm. things I always said was when I stopped enjoying it, then I won't do it anymore. And yeah. uh, a few years back, you know, when, when I didn't need to do it for, for the money, 
I carried on because I liked it. And then it got to a point where um, I stopped enjoying it as much. And I thought, okay, well, now let's pack it in. You know? So a few years back, I, I suppose I kind of retired and, and stopped and stopped playing. I'll still do the occasional, like the wedding or a wedding or a birthday of a friend or something and, and pull the guitar out. But it was something that I did for, for extra time. But I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed singing and playing guitar and, 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 and the harmonica as well. So it was good, it was good fun. Cool. But I'm, I'm always so jealous, seriously, of, of anyone that can sing and play guitar or play any sort of instrument, you know, like you kind of talk about it in a way lightly, but this is an amazing skill to have, you know, and I just, uh, yeah, I always wish I could do it. So, yeah. Well, dude, when, I'm, I'm so uncoordinated. I'm so uncoordinated. So, so I'm like, if I could do it, you know, then, then anybody, <laughs> anybody can. Okay, maybe not the singing, you know, because... It, Cause you've got to have a good voice and things, but but yeah, I'm like no, it's it's possible for anyone to learn because I'm I'm so uncoordinated that uh, that I managed to I managed to learn how to do it. So so yeah. But it's also so cool how like you you literally go into a bar with your guitar and a microphone and your harmonica, mm-hmm. and you sort of jam and you have people enjoying themselves. You know what I mean? It's just like it's such a cool thing to be able to do. You know, there's the other side of that, which is kind of soul destroying when, when, when people aren't enjoying themselves, you know, and like you, you finish the song and no one claps and you're like, okay, what am I doing here? But, uh, but generally it was good and, 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 a, and a lot of fun. And, and yeah, again, I, I enjoyed it. And I, I also managed to learn a couple of Portuguese songs and people really appreciated the fact that he has this, this, this foreign guy singing Portuguese songs. Um, so yeah, it was good. It was good fun. It was good fun. That's cool, man. Yeah. I, I was watching you, like following you on Insta, like uh, a lot at those stages. And I was like, yeah. this guy's a flipping rock star, basically. <laughs> I was literally thinking, I was like, he's flipping playing everywhere in Portugal. It's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, the, the coolest place I played was inside the, remember we went to see, we, we, we went to that castle, Gareth, when you and yeah. I came the first time and I played in the, in the castle. That was awesome. That was like always a dream mm-hmm. for me was to play in that castle. And then, and then a couple of years back, someone invited me to play in the castle and that was, that was cool. really cool. And oh, I mean, right. there could have been, you know, it could have been one of those concerts where there was no one and I would have just been happy because I was inside the castle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was good fun. Yeah, I don't know about a rock star, but, but I enjoyed it, you know, I enjoyed it. And, and there were a couple of nights where, you know, people really got into it and, and then it's really a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, eventually you get to a point where it's, you know, you're finishing at three o'clock in the morning and you're taking your career seriously and you, you need to pick your, you need, you need to be fresh the next day. And then what's the point, you know? So, so yeah, so, so eventually I stopped, but yeah, uh, but I, it was good while it lasted. And uh, mm. again, no regrets, no regrets. It was the right time mm. to stop as well. That's cool, man. And then I think it was along this kind of, uh, or uh, during this time where you basically, you know, stopped it, that you basically said to yourself, I need to really take full responsibility for my life here and um, just take things to the next level, you know, make or break sort of decision. So, so how, yeah. how did that sort of, yeah, um, yeah, you know, you, I guess it's a, it's a growing up thing, you know, and, and um, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, you not to blame background and things like that, but you, you, we come from backgrounds where we, unfortunately our generation and generations younger it's never our fault you know it's always somebody else's fault and and it's not it's on you it's on you as the the person to take responsibility of your own life and 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 you know i I just got to a point with you know a couple of very tough conversations with 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 people around me and family members and my stepdad and and um where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not, I'm not being the best version of myself. I'm not performing to the, to the, to the best of my ability as a, as a, as a human being, as a, as a leader, as a worker, as a, as a man, you know, and um, it was, it was just a case of, okay, do you want to really do this properly and, and take ownership of your life and make a success of it? Or do you want to carry on just, you know, and living in mediocrity is the wrong is maybe the wrong phrase, but kind of something along those lines. Do, do you want to make something of, of your life or do you just want to carry on and disappear one day? And, 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 and that was sort of the, 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 the journey that I went on, I suppose. And, and again, you know, it was a thing of, you know, I need to constantly be improving myself. I need to, I need to read. I need to look after myself a little bit more. Um, and and take again take ownership of of my life and, and and make a success of this this opportunity that I've got, 
and that was yeah that was the that was the oh, it was a it was a turning point it was a turning point because I remember, I remember when, like, uh, when you and I caught up last year, and this obviously happened before then. Um, yeah. But you know, we like we got talking about certain podcasts and stuff that we listened to, and I was like, mm. "Wow, this Oak's really into sort of personal development and um, yeah. you know, making himself a better person." So, so what are the other things that you kind of did? Yeah, so um, it was it was reading um, and educating myself, and you know, doing things that possibly t- taking myself, I mean, I was re- always taking myself out of my comfort zone. I was always really bad at maths um, and, and accounting and things. And, you know, you kind of need that. You need to know numbers when you do doing sales. And, and so it was kind of relearning and reprogram- re- reprogramming as, as, as Bruce Lipton would say, you know, reprogramming mm-hmm. things. And, and then, yeah, getting into the podcast, that was, that was quite a huge thing for me was, because you just you get inspired by these amazing, you know. I think the first couple of podcasts I listened to was the, um, uh, what's it? How 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 they how I built this. Yes, um, yes. You know that was the first couple of ones, and then you 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 find other ones like Finding Mastery and and with uh, Michael Gervais and things like that, and 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 it just it just inspires you and you learn new things and and you apply it to your own life and then it was you know other things like just looking after yourself physically so it was getting up early you know exercise um when you're in a little bit of a funk okay instead of sitting at home on the sofa feeling sorry for yourself because you lost a deal get out and get on your bike and go for a cycle you know mm-hmm. don't go to the don't go to the pub you'd rather get out and go for a run and, and do the right thing that's that's good for you so i got into stand-up paddle boarding and mountain biking and running and 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 it got to a point where as a single guy you've got time to do all these things and then i kind of like met diane and she was like okay you need to slow down a bit yeah you know I'd like, to, I'd like to see you every night and i'd like to see you occasionally so that was like the, our biggest problem at the beginning was that she wanted to spend time with me you know so, um, but, um, it happens. but yeah so it was just a case of you know just looking after looking after myself and and, and taking ownership and and um just being again, just being the best version of myself in the situation or in the circumstances that I found myself in. Um, so yeah, so but when you came out, I was already on that path of of trying to of, of self improvement all the time, and and by then had already you know found some success at work, and and, and you know I'm I've done well, and 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 I'm happy with the way things have gone, but it's it's a you know it's not I'm not anywhere close to what I want to be, you know. And we just, I just want to keep growing and keep developing as a, as a person, as a, as a leader, as a salesman. Um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, it's exciting. Yeah. Congrats, man. I dig how you said, you know, make the decision to not go to the pub and go and do something else. That, that's, that's total, real reprogramming, isn't it? Making yeah. the decision to do the, maybe the, the less of the default mode and and we so easy to go to the default. So, so well done, man. It's really inspiring. You you mentioned you met uh, Diane um, and you had your first son, Ben. Yeah. So, so Diane, um, it's amazing. I mean, I, 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 Diane and I got, we got set up by, uh, it's a little bit embarrassing. Uh, I used to get my, I, I, I get my back waxed. Uh, cause I'm one of those, bo- I'm one of those bohemians that get back hair. And, the, and, and, and I got to a point where I was like, I think I need to like, I'd like to meet someone now, you know, I'd, 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 uh, you know, I was enjoying single life and, and, and I went away on, a, on summer holiday and I went on my own and I was, and I was actually like, I, th- I think this is the last time I want to do this, you know? And I said to this girl who, who used to ask my back, I said, listen, if you know anybody, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to meet someone. And she said, uh, yeah, I, I know this, this girl, she's lovely. And, you know, she's got two kids. And I said, well, like two kids? No, <laughs> no, you know. And she was like, no, she's really nice. Just meet her. And, um, and I met Diane and, and it just went from there. And most beautiful person I've met and, uh, again, changed my life. And, and with this last bout of, of, of illness, she was amazing, you know, and, and two beautiful daughters who call me dad and, um, and treat me like their dad and, and I treat them like my girls and wonderful, beautiful family. And, and it went from having this very um, busy, but quiet life, I suppose, to noise all the time, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's completely changed my life in, in the most beautiful and, and crazy 
and uh, way and uh, and then yeah and then uh, last year July we we had our we had um, our, our boy um, we wanted to have a boy because of the th- you know we, we thought three girls is going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge <laughs> and uh, and Benjamin was born on the of July last year um, so he's already a year old um, and just he's just a beautiful he's he's got a re- he's got his dad's build he's got a big <laughs> ass and and big arms and chubby toes and fingers and 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 he's going to be a rugby player for sure <laughs> but, uh, a, a beautiful boy to add to our our daughters and it's, we just have the most amazing beautiful family. Um, amazing, so, yeah. Man. yeah that's super cool man and yeah you do have a great family um diane is absolutely wonderful and um like you said but uh, and and benjamin is such a cute little oak too but but like you said about diane um being an absolute rock and um i really found out about this uh recently because this year you had um a relapse again of ttp and actually yeah. it was this was this was really really bad and and I mean you know as a buddy I can just tell you that like I'm so thankful and grateful to to still have you here but because there was there was times when it was really touch and go and um fortunately Diane was there and like I had quite a few long conversations with her and kept in touch with her on WhatsApp and stuff and you know you were you were in a bad in a bad way um, and you actually ended up being in hospital for like five months, was it? But it was a long, yeah, long almost, time. Yeah, almost five months. Yeah. Yeah. M- maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that because that was that was tough, but Yeah. So, so the problem started last year already, where I wasn't well, um, and I and I and I knew I wasn't. I, I didn't have the same energy levels as I as I as I usually have or that I had had. Um, I was I was out of shape. I wasn't doing well physically. You know, things like my knees and my ankles were swelling up, and and a lot of acid, and um, and and I was just low. I was just I was just low. I just felt low, and and I couldn't get out of that. I couldn't get out, and and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I was getting stressed and frustrated with myself because why can't I get out of this funk? Why am I? Why am I so serious all the time? Why am I so stressed? Why am I so grumpy uh, at work and, and, and at home? You know, and and um, and I, and and then this year, at the beginning of this year, end of last year, I was feeling started feeling worse, and and in the back of my head, I was kind of like, is this is this thing is this TTP coming back? And I really didn't want it to because I, I've been through it twice, and now I've got this beautiful family, and I don't want to put yeah. them through, I don't want to put them through it. Uh, I'm in a foreign country as well, um, you know, where I haven't really had to go to doctors or hospitals yet, and 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 what how's that going to be? And you know, she so got all these little fears, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, I, I don't want it to be this thing, but I kind of maybe already knew, but I was stubbornly like, no, it'll pass, and 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 then. Diane kept saying to me, you're not okay. Maybe we just go to the hospital. I'll go to the doctor, get a checkup. And I was like, no, it'll pass. I'll be fine. It's a virus. It's a bug. It's whatever. Always these excuses. Mm. Um, and then nearer to, you know, the beginning after Christmas and New Year's, um, you know, I was tired a lot. And I thought, okay, it's just because I've got a, ba- a newborn baby. But it really wasn't that, you know, because just I was, there was just physically there was something seriously wrong. And, um, it got to a point where I was getting home and I was just collapsing on the sofa. I was so tired, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't lift myself up to go and eat something. And, and eventually um, one day just, you know, Diane got really annoyed and, 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 and said, you really need to go. And I went and I got some blood tests and, um, and it turns out my platelet count was uh, at 6,000, which wow. you know, is like really low. And so, um, what happened was I had the blood tests and usually what happens is they email you with your results and they say, okay, so what we recommend is this and or maybe, and they phoned and they're like, listen, you need to go to the hospital right now because hmm. your blood results are really bad. And so I went to the hospital and the, 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 the nurse there was like, okay, your, your plate to come 6,000. I said, okay, 6,000, we can work with that. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and the nurse was like, are you out of your mind? 6,000 is nothing. And then, um, and uh, one, well, to backtrack a little bit, one of the things that, that also happened was I started bleeding in my mouth and that was really when I knew, okay, this, there's a serious problem here. So my gums were bleeding. And, um, 
and so then so yeah and then and then uh, the next day they transferred me to to Santa Maria uh, clinic or Santa Maria hospital in Lisbon which is a to a hematology uh, uh, in, oh, hematologist yeah hematology unit in in, in the hospital and um, they did the, the the first day that I got there um, they were I mean it was amazing they were English speaking doctors so because I can speak the language, but I can't, but, but when it comes to these technical things, you don't want anything to be lost in yeah. translation. And so there were these, these doctors and they spoke perfect English and they knew about the disease and they were like, listen, 6,000 is really bad. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to straight away, we're going to get you a catheter. Um, we're going to install a catheter in, in, in your neck and we're going to get you onto a dialysis machine as soon as we can. And three o'clock that morning or three o'clock the next morning, I was doing my first dialysis treatment. They put a, they couldn't get it in the neck because I had too much scar tissue from the previous um, catheters. Wow. So they had to put it in my leg. Um, mm-hmm. So they first, but they first tried to put it in my neck. And so they cut oh. my neck and they couldn't get it in. They were like, okay, we're going to go for, we're going to put it in your leg now. So they put it in the leg and then they did the first dialysis. And I was so, I, I was so aware of the fact that the first ever time I did dialysis, I'd had that mild stroke and it had gone really badly that I yes. thought, okay, it's 10 years 10 years now since, no, more, um, more that I've had a problem. How is my body going to react to this dialysis, you know? Yeah. So I was just saying my family's name, uh, each of their names in my head, so that I wouldn't lose focus. So I was <laughs> sitting there going, Di- Di- Diane, Maggie, Freddie, Benjamin. Benjamin, Freddie, Maggie, Diane, back and forth in my head so that I could just stay with the process. And I did that for three hours. What until, until the dialysis was, was finished. And then it was the most amazing thing they finished. And they said, just close your eyes a little bit, have a nap. And I, and, I, and, I, and I closed my eyes a little bit. And then I woke up and one of our friends was in the room, was in the, was in there. Who she happens to work at the hospital for good friends of mine and Diane. And just seeing someone that, you know, mm. uh, was, was huge. I was like, okay, it's going to be fine. And that was kind of like, then I knew I'd be okay. And then, yeah, we still had a couple of hiccups along the way. My platelet count from that point went up very quickly, but then it dropped back down really badly. So at one stage, it went up to around 280,000, I think it was. And then over a weekend, it dropped to 4,000. Hmm, and what? then we just kind of like restart again, you know? And um, and then that was all going okay. And, and you know, I was able to like WhatsApp people and talk to people. And, and my attitude in the hospital was just... I'd read that Bruce Lipton book, The Biology of Belief, and my attitude was just, just stay happy. Just stay happy. So um, this is where I must say to you guys, um, I listen to your guys' podcast all the time. And because it's just such a happy, you guys create such a happy podcast. Such a, your conversations are always so happy and, and it was so positive. And so when I do my walks in the mornings in the, in the passageway, I'd listen to you guys. And <laughs> I say thank you so much because it, it was one of the things that helped me stay positive when it was, would have been really easy to, to get down and negative. And um, so it was awesome. Um, and uh, so yeah, my thing was just stay positive and pump your body with full of those po- that positive energy and, and those positive things in your blood. And, and, and so I'd be friendly to everyone. And make, I, my, my, I, would, um, I started journaling and I was like, okay, so I'm going to do a write it forward journal. So I would write in the evening, I would write down what's going to happen tomorrow. And it would be like, dialysis is going to go well. Uh, you're going to be friendly to everybody. You're going to be patient. You're not going to, you're not going to be, um, you're not going to get impatient with anybody. Um, you, you, you know, you're going to make five people laugh and you're going to make 10 people smile. And you're going to, and you know, there was all these kind of things that I was like, I'm just going to try to be as positive and happy and friendly as I can, because that's going to help me get through this thing. And, uh, so yeah, that's what I did. And then, um, and then I contracted a bacterial infection from a guy in the hospital and, uh, and it was, it was quite hectic. I was supposed to go home, uh, for, for a night uh, and two days because they were like, listen, it'll be good for you to go home and spend a bit of time with your family and then come back and we'll see how you respond, um, mm. how your blood count is and everything. And then, uh, that, it was supposed to be the Saturday that I was going to go home. And the Friday night I did a dialysis treatment. It didn't go well. I was really uncomfortable. I was very hot and feverish and didn't feel good. And it took a long time. And then that night, um, 
at about probably around, it was actually early in, in the morning, probably about one o'clock in the morning, I started getting cold shivers and, um, and, and, and sweating. And, and that lasted about 20 minutes. And I thought to myself, do I need to call a nurse? But then it went away, so I thought, okay, now I'm fine. And then the next morning at about six-ish, one of the nurses came to check my temperature. And my temperature was at 39.8 <laughs> degrees Celsius. And she's like, this is really high. And uh, I'm worried about this. And then I had like another shaking, cold fever, cold shakes and everything. But this time it was really bad. I was like, I couldn't stop shaking. Um, they had to give me an oxygen mask because I was battling to breathe. Um, and then what happened was they said to me, um, you we're going to take you to ICU because the machines are better and it's just a precaution. You've got a bacterial infection, but it's just a precaution. Hmm. I phoned Diane and I said, listen, I'm, I'm not coming home. Um, but they sent me to ICU, but it's just a precaution that the machines are better. The hospital phoned Diane, told her the same thing. Mm. And then um, 24 hours later, I was in a coma um, because they had to induce, induce, because the only thing they could do with this bacterial infection was heavily, heavily sedate me. And uh, then it was kind of up to me to, to pull out of the coma. And so then I was in the ICU for about a month. Um, <sighs> and that was quite a hectic, that was quite hectic. Yes, yes but, man, yeah. Good Lord. And it was the touch and go. Is. Like it literally, you know, yeah. there was there was moments where we were like, we're not too sure what's going to happen if he's going to make it. Yeah, I mean, there was five days where I was just under, and no one knew when I was going to wake up. So yes. yeah, you know, that was that was it was a, it was five days after that I that I that I came through because basically what the doctors said to my family was he's he's under now, and it's up to him to come out, to wake up. And, and so obviously I don't remember being under and, and mm. like this, this mark on my face is, from, is, is apparently from um, tubes that I had in my nose and then they had pipes down my throat and because it was hot, uh, it actually burnt me on my, because they had to lie me down, they had to lie me down on my, on my stomach and they had to change me all the time so the fluids in my lungs wouldn't mm. stay in one place and it would move around. Um, and yeah, so it was quite a, I don't remember too much. Um, I had, I hallucinated a lot. So like one time I, I, I dreamt or hallucinated that we were being attacked, that the hospital was being attacked by monkeys and wow. these kind of things happened. And there was one stage where I was basically having deja vu and everything was just repeating itself. So my oh, sisters wow. had visits, had come to visit from London and, um, they just kept walking in and I'd have the same conversation and one of them would walk out and the other one would walk in and then Always. the same one would walk in again. And eventually I still remember I, I, I had this little chalkboard that I could write stuff on. So, cause I couldn't talk cause I had these pipes down my throat and I had to write on this board if I wanted something, if I needed to communicate something to the nurses and my sister, Alshandra, um, I, I, you know, this was after like, obviously this, this, there was no repetition. It, it was just in my mind. Mm. And uh, it's, it's crazy. And, and I wrote down deja vu on, <laughs> and I showed Alshandra and she couldn't, he, she couldn't read my handwriting. <laughs> and, and then she could read it. And then I tried it again and I wrote it and she could read it, but she didn't know what deja vu was. <laughs> <laughs> so she walked out of the room to, to my folks and stuff. And she was like, I'm really confused. I don't know what he was trying to tell me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a couple of, uh, you know, it's good to look back and laugh at it now. Yes. And there was a stage where one of the, the, di the, the, one of the main directors at the hospital got involved as well in terms of, it, she was the one who was like, listen, he's got, a he's got this bacterial infection. We need to get him to ICU. And if it wasn't for her, who knows what would happen. If they'd yes. let me go home, Jesus, I don't even want to know because I still said to the guy, so I've got a bit of a fever, you know, that's not going to, going home is not going to do any harm. Hmm. And he's like, no, we can't let you go home. Thank God they didn't let me go home because who yeah. knows what would have happened. Um, but, but even one of the things in ICU, uh, in the bed next to me, the guy died. And, um, and they wheeled him out into the hallway and, and covered him and everything. And she came to visit me and she saw this body lying in the hallway and, oh. she, and she thought it was me. And oh, she, started, no. she started crying and everything. Oh, and uh, so, yeah, these God. things happen. So, it, but, but, you know, when that happens, it kind of puts everything into perspective. And you're like, okay, it could still be worse, you know. Yeah. And, uh, oh, wow. and uh, in the normal hermitology ward, a guy died in, my, in the bed next to me as well. And you're kind of like, wow, that just really puts things into perspective. <laughs> 
um, here I am, I'm not doing well, but I'm, I'm, I'm still alive, you know? And uh, so it was hectic. So, and then um, I was still in ICU for quite a while and eventually they took the pipes out and I could start talking, which was amazing. Um, but I lost all the muscle in my legs. I couldn't walk. Um, I, I, I lost, um, I lost a lot of muscle mass on my arms and my hands were always shaking as well, which was really hectic. So I couldn't even like text and stuff. You know, you could, I couldn't work my fingers properly. I couldn't even open a, like a, a, a bottle of juice or a, a water or anything. It was so, I was so weak. And, um, even, and then what happened was they, then after I see, they moved me back into the normal hematology ward. And I, in my mind, I thought I could still walk. So I would try to get out of the bed and then I would just fall on the floor. Oh so the one, the one night I fell twice out of the bed oh. um, and uh, hurt myself. And then, and then they eventually they would tie me to the bed like, a, like, this, like this type of a straight jacket thing. And, Jesus. and I'd have to sleep like that. It was the most uncomfortable thing. Oh but, my God. And then again, you've just got to like kind of stay positive and be like, okay, this is going to pass. And, and they're like, until you kind of can stop doing this thing of trying to get out of the bed because you can't walk. They keep trying to tell me. And eventually it was my stepdad again. He was like, listen, you're not going to leave. They're not going to let you leave. You're not going to get out of this place if you carry on doing these things. <laughs> and this was after the last fall. And the last fall was the worst one because what had happened was, Shane, I, I'd, I'd, um, I'd convinced Diane to untie me. Uh, because what they said was, you're allowed to, they, you, when your family's visiting you, they can untie you. And uh, and because you're not going to, you know, they'll stop you if you try to get out the bed or anything. And then I said to Diane, please don't tie me up again. Like when she was leaving, I was like, please don't tie me up again. I'm so uncomfortable. They'll tie me up just now. And she left. Mm. She agreed. And I got, a, I tried to get out of the bed again. And I felt mm. really badly. I smacked my face on the floor and bruised my whole face. And, oh, and, yes, they, they, and that was when like my stepdad was like, you can't do this you know and it was hectic like uh, uh, even with icu i had people coming to visit and i don't remember them visiting um, my dad flew over from south africa and my uncle as well and, and luckily i i remember them being there and, and and i saw them when i was a little bit better at the end of icu so that was amazing and my sisters and, and, and things like that so i had amazing support network around me uh without my family and and, and, and without die I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they kept me, they kept me going that last month after ICU when I couldn't walk. And you went, I went from before ICU, I was walking up and down the passage and high five and nurses and listening mm. to you guys on podcasts and listening to music and doing squats and fucking walking eight kilometers. And then mm. ICU happened. And then I get out of ICU and I can't walk. I have to wear a nappy. Um, mm you know, and I, and, and I have to have someone feed me and it was just like, yes, you know. I can I'll just start rest. And then I got, I just had to get stronger and got better. And I had physio come and help me get back, get, you know, get my legs working again. And, uh, it was, it was a hectic time. And, it, and eventually I got better and they said, okay, um, you can go. And when I left home, when I left the hospital, I, could, I still couldn't walk. I had to get wheeled out in a wheelchair and I had to do physio at home every single day to get the muscle back in my legs and, and uh, to get moving again. And it went from wheelchair to Zimmer frame to crutches to now I can walk and drive. And, and that's been all in, a, in, a, in about two months. So it's been an amazing, amazing journey. Um, but just, it was a hectic time. It was a hectic time and, and, and a hectic for my family that, that had to go through that. And, and you know, little Benjamin I've been away for half of his life you know um yeah. and uh so it's kind of like re like him relearning that this is this 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 guy's important to his life and this this guy's sticking around a bit and and being yeah. you know the girls for the girls it was tough as well um for, yes. for the little one especially hmm. so it, was, it was a hectic it was a hectic time uh, well, Dylan, you're a true inspiration man like seriously yeah, just incredible it's, it's impossible us, for us to fathom really like what you've been through and you still bring some positivity. How, how was that, that first day home? How did you feel? Yeah, it, uh, it was a weird thing. Um, relieved, obviously really happy to be with my family. I mean, we sat around and, and my mom still said, what do you want to eat? And, and my favorite dish is macaroni cheese, you know? And I said, yeah, macaroni cheese. I'm, I'm down with that. And it's a joke in our family that, whenever it's been my birthday and like my stepmom 
um, would always say to me, what do you want to eat? You can have anything you want. And I'll be like, mac and cheese. It's mac good. and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I said to my mom, yeah, mac and cheese. And we sat down. And, and one of the things that happened with, with hospital was my stomach really shrunk. So I couldn't eat big portions. And I must have had like three forkfuls of mac and cheese. And I'm like, oh. I'm full now, you know. But I still had some the next day, so it was okay. <laughs> um, but it was it was strange. It was it was kind of it was a relief, but it was also kind of scary because you kind of like I don't want to go back, um, and I'm back in the real world now. And and, and 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 that last month where you know you're in a you're in a nappy and um, and you've digressed so much that broke me not broke me but that that yeah, maybe it did broke me a little bit, you know, and, and so mm. being back home, I knew this is going to have to be another recovery. You know, this is going to have to be another little battle that I have to fight. And, you know, mm. I had a lot of, I had a lot of nightmares uh, the first few weeks when I was back home. Mm. Um, and most of it was about ICU and having those pipes in my, down my throat and stuff. And, and it was kind of like um, waking up, remembering that and, and and going okay this is this has left a mark and and i have to get through this as well and then the mm. frustration of not being able to hold my kids because kids have got our, our little vestiges for these bacterial infections mm -hmm. and stuff especially babies so i couldn't even we couldn't even have the baby in the same room as as myself and die um whenever i was around people i had to wear masks so that was all frustrating but at the same time you're grateful because you're not in that place you're not in hospital anymore so it's this balancing act of um, yeah. being grateful for how far you've come, and then, the, but then the determination to go. Okay, I still need to keep going. You know, I still need to stay positive. I still need to push. I still need to get better. Um, and then, you know, there was the first checkup, going back to hospital the first time afterwards, and really not wanting to be there. Mm. You know, and it was even Diane was even laughing because there was a doctor who was trying to speak to me and I couldn't even look into her in the eyes because I'm like, I just don't want to see anybody mm. associated to what happened. I don't want to think about it. I don't want it to happen mm. again. And it was this, it was a little bit, yeah, there was this fear of, I don't want to get sick again. You know? Now mm. the way I feel about it is if it had to happen again, I know I can, I know I can get through because I've, I've done it. I don't want it to, to happen again, but, um, but I, but I feel better about it now than what I did the, those first few weeks being back home, I suppose. And I think, you know, one of the things that they do warn you about with these kind of things is a, is a type of a PTSD, you know, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder, which I think, you know, I think there's an aspect of that, you know, where you're like, this has left the mark and, and, and I need to, I either need to speak to somebody about it or I need to do a lot of inner yeah. work to figure it out and to, 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 to heal not just physically, but internally as well. And that, that, yeah. that's what those first few weeks were about. So, so yeah, that was also a journey on its own. And, and then now it's getting back to work and trying to catch up to, to where you were and, and dealing with the fact that I'm not 100% physically strong yet and, and things like that, you know, and so it's all this, uh, a lot of patience required. And yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but it's good. I mean, again, compared to where I was, I, I can only be grateful. Know, yeah. what's happened and the journey 100% but like I mean even when I saw you like a couple of months ago compared yeah. to now it's light and day you know mm -hmm. what I mean and and the progress has just been amazing so you know just like you said you got to just keep up that good mindset forward thinking and the progress has been absolutely outstanding yeah. um, and uh, it's just great to see bud cool thank you no worries, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 that's when it pays off for being to be a stubborn ass, you know, uh, <laughs> just like plow on and, and, and just keep going. So, but I think one of the things that I've learned from all of this is also sometimes not to be stubborn and listen to your body, you know, listen to mm -hmm. why am I tired? Why am I not feeling well? Mm. Don't, don't be a stubborn ass and do something about it. And, and, and it was one of the things that you guys spoke about in, in one of the, the recent podcasts is that proactivity it was in your mm. superhuman ship podcast after um, uh, I think speaking to Alexis Ray, I think it was mm -hmm. you're talking about that productivity of, well, um, we can't control everything that happens, but we can, we can be proactive in, in how we look after our bodies and how we look mm. after our, 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 our lives and our minds. And, and that's something that I have to re recapture again and, and, and take a lot more seriously. We're not indestructible, you know, and, um, and yeah, so that's really, really important going forward. 
Cool, man. So massive. And that's the thing, Adrian, is that a lot of people listening, even though they've heard your story, that people still feel like a lot of them will be like, I'm okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not Dylan or I'm not someone else, but mm -hmm. things can change in anybody's life. So yeah, it's just yeah. such a good lesson, isn't it? To just always value your health when you feel good and be, you know, if you can walk up the stairs and go and do something, that's already enough to be super grateful for something, you know? So, um, it's just such a good reminder. Um, Exactly. So Dylan, what, what are you, what are you most excited about at the moment and for the future? And, and also how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So, so from a personal level, um, I'm finding that I'm just, uh, I, everything that I'm doing, I'm, I just, I, I find myself getting flooded. Like gratitude just floods, floods in and, and, you know, from driving to having a conversation with your child to, to holding Benjamin, to kissing my, to, to kissing Diane, to all these little things, to speaking to mm. colleagues, to it's all just you, 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 you've been in the hospital for five minutes, and then you can do these things again, and, and it's just beautiful. You know, it's just that's the only way I can describe it. It's beautiful. So that's exciting me. I'm excited to get back to work with a with probably a different type of mindset. Um, my relationship with stress has changed. Um, I think. I've, one of the things that happened while I was in hospital was I, I started to read up and get a lot, uh, do a lot more, um, get a lot more into sto sto uh, stoicism. Stoicism. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I call it stoicism, but it's not stoicism. <laughs> um, stoicism, and, and that's been really, really cool. And and um, and that was a really interesting philosophy to 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 to, to start to sort sort of start to take on while I was in hospital because. Mm the real philosophy is you can't change what happens around you, but you can change how you react. And that was really what you have to do when you're in a position like that. So yeah. I'm excited about, you know, sort of re-entering my life because I don't want to change anything. I don't want to change my job. I don't want to, I want to, I want to live this life and I have this beautiful family, but I, I, I want to, I've been given a second chance to do things better. And, uh, and that's what I'm really, really excited about and uh yeah in terms of where people can find me i'm not huge on 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 facebook i'm not on instagram anymore um but you know linkedin and twitter uh people can find me there as, as dylan herald um so so yeah awesome my man cool buddy Thanks, so buddy. so that's great stuff and uh, those are really cool excite things to be excited about and i think people on often take the small things for granted and it's like mm -hmm. no it's the small things that actually count you know, yeah. so you, you've had this amazing reality check to actually recognize exactly. that, you know. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so about our last question, as you probably well know. Um, I have no idea what you're going to ask me next. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> this is what everything's off the cuff, which is great. <laughs> so, but what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I, I think, uh, you know, this, this is an answer that could change. And if you had to ask me again in a year's time, maybe, but I think really what it, for me, what it boils down to is, is um, being the best that we can in, you know, with what we've got and in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, because uh, we all are in, we all fighting different battles. We all have things that are going on in our lives and, and we all just doing the best that we can, you know, and uh, well, we should be doing the best that we can. And so that's what I say. Being ridiculously human is, is, is being the best version of yourself in the place that you find yourself in. So uh, that's, that's what I'll say it is. Brilliant, Brilliant. Oh, man. Yeah. And it's so true, but it's so true. You know what I mean? Like we literally are all fighting these different battles and doing different things and whatnot. And then we must be conscious that everyone is actually doing these things and um, that probably we are all trying our best and, and uh, that's really, really cool, man. And I, yeah, I hope everyone kind of like, you know, just, just acknowledges that definitely. Um, so I just wanted to say, like a huge thank you but for, for coming on our podcast. Like, like I said in the start, this is a conversation which I've wanted to have with you for a long, long time now. And I'm so glad that it happened. And, you know, you, it just kind of reinstalls like so many things for me. And two things kind of stand out is that you really don't need to look far for people that are inspiring for people that are brave, for people that are mm. courageous, you know, and 
my man, you are like next level when it comes to that. And it's so obvious just by listening to your story, um, how this is something you just take naturally in your life. And you just, you don't mind kind of putting yourself out there and trying new things and, and taking the world on. Do you know what I mean? And coming through everything. It doesn't matter what's been thrown at you. You've dealt with it and you've dealt with it well. And then you've also not just dealt with it, but you've, you've kind of taken a step back and you've learned lessons from it. You know, and you're like, like now you're just talking about almost dying in hospital, but then all the lessons off the back of that, which is, is rather incredible. Um, and the other thing is once again, is like, we must really talk to each other more, you know, because it's, it's the people that are close to us that we don't actually necessarily speak to enough and know enough about their stories. And um, this just kind of reiterates that once again. Um, but, but, but you, Honestly, like I, I really look up to you and I really respect you as a person, as a human. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have had you in my life as a friend and, and that our future is going to be massive because we're going to be like, you know, close to each other in Portugal. And um, it's uh, really something I'm excited about and it means a lot to me and it's going to be special. And uh, yeah, just keep being such an awesome guy and, uh, and, and leading, you know, just naturally without even like, you know, being this boisterous kind of out there person, you don't, you just, you just do it naturally. And that's awesome. But so uh, thanks again for, for also just telling us like your story so raw, you know what I mean? Not, not um, sort of making up anything and just sort of uh, saying it as it is. And I think that's super important. So um, we've had you for a long time on the chat. Sorry, it's good. It's, it's carried on a little bit, but we really appreciate your time. But, and, you know, you as a, as a, a listener uh, have been like such a great support and also provided such amazing feedback, which just means the world to us. Um, but most of all, you're, you're a great buddy. And, and that's what uh, just means the world to, to me and to Craig as well. So thanks for your time again, bud. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys. Again, um, I can't reiterate enough how, how, how much you're hearing you guys and, and, and the energy and the joy in your podcast, how much it helped me during that time and, and how much I still love it. And uh, it's been a real honor to, to be, to be here with you guys and, and to chat. So thank you for having me. Pleasure, and, uh, and and just John. briefly from my side, Matt, it's just like literally what Gareth said, uh, just rings so true all the way through. And one thing that's a real testament to someone like yourself is before I really knew you, before we like became buddies and stuff, I, I said to Gareth long ago, like, I just have this feeling that Dylan is just such a good person. And even though I didn't actually know you, like, but mm. somehow you, you, you have this ability to um, transmit this sort of energy, this good energy about you. And it, it's totally filtered through our conversations with Gareth and, and, you know, via the grapevine kind of thing. And, and that's just, I think that's so great, you know, so keep that up. And, and just speaking to you today has just been a total testament to that. You, you're, your honesty and your your caring nature is is second to none. And even though just t thinking about your story, like you just had at the root of it, you just cared for others. You know, even asking the doctor or the kids at the, at the church, you you always looked out for others as well. And and I'm glad that you're looking after yourself now too. And you you're making that in it, that effort to to care for yourself that much more and go inside. And and um, because oftentimes people that are so caring for others they don't always take that that same energy to themselves you know mm. and that's yeah. good to hear because you're that's going to make you just have more energy to care for others when you care for yourself so so keep it up man and, uh yeah i'm just like so grateful to have met you you know and this is one of the amazing things about what we do is we get to connect with great people and i'm just super stoked that that we've got to to meet as well and uh, I look forward to seeing you, you boys on the other side of, uh, of the pond. Yeah, you're going to have to come and visit us, man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, man, thanks again for all your time and your energy and your inspiration, buddy. Thank you, guys. It's been, it's been, a, it's been an absolute honor. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate the encouragement. And, and keep doing what you guys are doing because you're spreading happiness and joy and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and having conversations and stories with people. And it's a beautiful thing. So keep it up. Uh, I'm thanks. looking forward to to the future, to the future of Ridiculously Human. <laughs> cool. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Cool, guys. Thanks. Cool, well done. Thanks. Great Take stuff, care. bud. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. 
stop at the toll, digging for change, snow.